So on the surface level of every human, there's behavior. And that's the easiest thing that we see is behavior. But what creates the behavior is the question. It's the story we're telling ourselves. And what they've learned is the story that you're telling yourself is created by an emotion. So when you crack that emotion, you go into the belief you have about the world and the belief you have about the world comes from your original incident. It's called the OI, your trauma. Every human has an original incident, a trauma, that creates your belief about the world. Your belief about the world creates an emotion. Your emotion creates a story you're telling yourself, and the story you're telling yourself creates your behavior. So we try to get to the fifth level of like, when was that moment? And it could be something small, but to really go into those five levels of like, okay, let's go to the core. But the hardest part about that is you have to go back to that child and you have to go really inward in this meditation and this prayer to re-encounter that five-year-old version of yourself and hold them and support them and know that they're gonna be okay. We can always point fingers on what's wrong with the world or culture or government or whatever, but it's really like, okay, how are you feeling? What are you doing about yourself? We're either receiving a frequency and we're either like being controlled by the outcomes of COVID or the, the stock market, or we find this sense of peace where this world creates our outer world. Because we've seen a lot of people go through hardships and be in situations where culturally be like, oh man, that must be tough. And they're like, oh, I'm pretty good. Like I'm peaceful because they control this. When your internal world is affected by your outer, external world, then you're in trouble. Um, or your internal world can be, you can emit a frequency and create the reality around you. That was BC Cerna, a man on a mission to help people feel loved, seen, heard, and encouraged and start a revival both internally within you and externally around you. He's the founder of Pursuing Purpose, a collection of retreats and online programs helping to heal your heart, reveal your purpose, and discover your tribe. We explore jealousy, confidence, our egos and divisiveness, unresolved hurts or trauma that reflects our pain and emotions, community, triggers and spirituality, leaning into curiosity and challenging yourself, and embracing the gray, all centered around healing your heart and transforming your trauma from pain into purpose and helping others. In this episode, we open up a heart-centered conversation on things even as delicate as spirituality and beliefs. And that's what we're really here for, to lean into each other's stories so that we can find more compassion in each other through the way that they view the world and maybe even learn something from each other along the way. This conversation felt effortless and I feel so inspired from all the things BC shared. I hope you guys find joy in listening to our conversation and thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get started. All right, we are on. Thank you so much, BC, for coming on the podcast. I am so excited about this conversation talking all things healing your heart and trauma and pursuing purpose. So I firstly want to ask you, what makes you so passionate about this topic? Like, was there an experience that you had or what drives you with this passion? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, it's been a long journey. I've been on this journey for 14 years now since I really uh, oh, kind of came awake to like what's going on inside my body, what's going on in the world and how do I do something about it? Um, but I think what started all of it was I was a dipshit in high school and growing up, I didn't really know about volunteering or purpose or passions or like everything that made me a really bad student in school made me an amazing entrepreneur and creative and storyteller. Mm. And so my whole life, the school system was just, I'm broken because I would get F's and D's. And so what that did to my um, own heart, my own soul, my own mental capacity was just, oh, I don't fit into society or culture or as a human. And so I always felt alienated. Um, and so yeah, it was just a long journey. So once I, I traveled um, for six months in a study abroad program when I was 19, went to Thailand, lived like in these orphanages and helped with some communities there. And for the first time in my life, I was like, whoa, there's so much more than just A's and B's and D's and F's on grades. That's all I knew, right? And growing up in the suburbs of Denver. Uh, and so that was really the, the part where I was just like, oh, I got to do something for people in the world. And uh, that's where it started when I was 19, for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So I, I, I did a study abroad program for six months and then same thing. I was, I was going to college to play basketball, but was never, still was failing, you know, most of my classes. And then the study abroad program was like, Hey, do you want to work for us and take college students around the world? And so I was like, yeah. And so for three and a half years, I took, um, about 700 college students from 50 different countries all around the world. Uh, and we stayed with host families. We volunteered in all these communities and, um, it was amazing. 
That's so cool. And I imagine really meaningful because you're seeing a lot of impact in a lot of different ways, not just in your own heart, but in other people. Totally. And staying with host families like locals, I stayed with over 200 host families um, during that time. And at one point I was 22 years old. So I've been traveling for like three years and I was like asking myself, I was reflecting and praying and meditating and had my journal out and I was like, all right, what's the biggest need in the world? And I want to go do whatever that is. And so I was like writing down, like, do I go help orphans in Africa or help the water crisis in different parts of the world? And what came down to like this algorithm I was creating, God was like, go back to the US and work with high school kids and help awaken as many high schoolers as you can. And I was like, that sounds not nearly as cool or fun. Um, and so I didn't want to do that, but that's like what I got um, from like, I feel like God and spirit told me that. So I went back to the US at 22 with the sole mission of working with high schoolers and started bringing high school kids around the world um, because no one ever gave me that opportunity. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it was a beautiful challenge, but it was amazing. And what is like the biggest need when you're working with high school kids that you see that could help open their hearts or what, what exactly does that mean? Opening their heart? What is, what's the result of that? Totally. I think America, you know, we have such awesome opportunity. Like this is where culture is kind of created, you know, in LA, New York. And, and so we have a really big opportunity to use our resources, our, um, our brains, our, uh, like advantage on some things to just give back to the world, like social entrepreneurship, you know, what like Tom's did or companies that are like, Hey, let's, let's create a company and, and conscious capitalism. Like let's make it mindful to help people. And so, yeah, I came back to, to just work with high school kids. Like what I wish I had when I was a high schooler, someone to believe in me, support me, tell me that grades isn't everything. Um, and then show me how to volunteer and get involved in my community to really just open up compassion, like really open up the empathy in my heart to know that life is much bigger than just sports and grades. Cause all I knew was sports and grades my whole life. Um, and I was just okay at both. <laughs> and so, yeah, I really started working with high school kids and just being vulnerable. Like, how do you share your heart and share your um, story and and really invite them into vulnerability, like where sports and men in America don't really teach that or encourage it. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it started and, and now it's been a 14 year journey since then. But um, yeah, it's been pretty powerful. Amazing. So let's jump right in then a little further into healing your heart, like what that means. Because a lot of what you talk about I see is healing your heart, you know, finding your purpose and or living with purpose and healing trauma. So where can we go from there to start, especially since you've worked with a lot of high school kids, a lot of times that trauma is already playing out in high school and we're, you know, our brains are developing and we have so much that we can heal from already, let alone into our adulthood if we don't like really go deep into looking back into like what has affected us, you know, from our childhood. Totally. Yeah. I think, I mean, I've sat with over a thousand high school kids in the last 14 years and hundreds of parents, like countless parents and on both ends. And, and really it comes down to what, what is the story being played out in culture? Like, why are we the wealthiest country in the world, but the most depressed suicidal country in the world? Like there's some conversation that needs to happen to be like, wow, we've really done good at wealth and really bad at happiness and, um, peace of mind. And so, uh, looking at, really trying to impact the youth is where you know it begins and starts and we kind of sometimes grow up and our heart gets a little bit harder and we we stop having open conversations or um we stop building those bridges like you're doing and 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 so i was like man if i can just impact youth and start the journey sooner than later um then i can really have a, a, an opportunity to help them not go through so many hardships you know the amount of oh, you know over 50 percent in america are divorced and mental health all these different things where it's like all right let's go to the the youth and ask them where they're feeling disconnected to their um, self and where the ego comes and plays a role that you are separate from your brother or your sister or your friends. Um, I call brother and sister, but um, yeah, so, so really started these programs. We have a, we have a workshop called if you really knew me um, and you sit down with this, these, you know, there's probably like uh, 200 students, but there's like a whole bunch of groups of six people and you lead the whole workshop prior to doing it with the kids, you lead by example, um, but you really go around in a circle with these kids and say, if you really knew me, you'd know this. And mm. doing 10 years of this and hearing stories that I, you know, you can't even fathom of, of from, you know, a 15 year old walking in on one of their parents trying to take their life, to like what that he does for his psyche to, um, you know, throwing a house party and one of your 
friends drowns in the backyard in the pool because they were drunk like so many stories these kids and they don't then kids don't have anywhere to share this mm -hmm. now therapy is becoming more normalized and not stigmatized uh, which is beautiful um, because we hit the tipping point I think you know with COVID and um, just we were like wow 100 kids in America take their life every day so we're like okay so we should probably figure out not the formula because America the western world we're just like oh here's a pill like oh you're sad here's a pill for that mm -hmm. and um, the holistic ways which we talked about with food with being outside with um, community uh, you know a lot of doctors don't ask what you're eating or um, how your heart is or your I guess when your heart is like how your you know your uh, your trauma is your story you yeah. know so yeah just really starting the conversation with kids and I'm so thankful because you know COVID did happen but it also opened up a huge awareness right for mental health therapy um, and all these things and even doctors nowadays if you ask doctors that are uh, therapists um, and any kind of doctor they'll say you know medication has its role and, and therapy has its role but community is the number one most important piece out of all that and doctors are like if I had to choose one of those it would be find community find people and support that you can walk through these questions and these emotions together mm. um, so yeah yeah because what happened with COVID people were so isolated a lot of people a lot of children who are going through such an important de developmental stage in their life and you're so right about the community aspect I don't know if you've heard of the blue zones but yeah how they talk about those nine common characteristics that have created the most um, centurions the longest living people of the earth and community is I'm not sure if that was the exact word used but it's, it's something about community and living with others being one of those nine common characteristics yeah which is so powerful yeah Denmark actually implemented a, an apartment complex program where you you live in an apartment you have your own room but you all eat together and commune together and it's like intentional community um, that has been like supported and and Denmark's like voted the happiest country in the world every year yeah um, because they believe in community so much right and you're so right about America too like a lot so much of it is materialistic driven and um, very focused on what you have what you own is what will create your greatness mm -hmm. when that's so not the case like we know that it really comes down to like healing your heart like the way I've never really used that phrase healing your heart but so much trauma that we experience that doesn't even have to happen from childhood but it could be something that you've experienced just a few years ago and you never really resolved it and it's just like lingering deep in your soul and anytime something comes up like a trigger it can affect your whole mindset of how you view yourself how you look at others how you respond to others and so I love what you're doing because by talking about healing your traumas in turn you end up being able to have better relationships with others which ends up helping everyone you're around it's like a it's like a magnifying effect that, yeah. what's the word like a an effect that makes ripple it effect. ripple effect yeah. that's the word <laughs> yeah and that's so important too of, of really starting with self right like we're you know we can always point fingers on what's wrong with the world or culture or government or whatever but it's really like okay how are you feeling what are you doing about yourself and and this so either humans were either receiving a frequency and we're either like being controlled by the outcomes of covid or the the stock market or we find this sense of peace where this world creates our outer world because we've seen a lot of people go through hardships and be in t situations where culturally be like oh man that must be tough and they're like oh, i'm pretty good like i'm peaceful because they control this mm -hmm. and if you don't con either this world affects controls this world or this world controls this world and if this world controls this inner world i'm sorry if people listen on the <laughs> podcast i'm like that. pointing to my heart when i say this world i'm so sorry um <laughs> but when when your internal world is affected by your outer external world then you're in trouble um or your internal world can be you can emit a frequency and create the reality around you yeah um and so really the programs we use and the, the one of the algorithms we use is there's five levels to every single human uh, regardless of who you are and each level creates a level so on the surface level of every human there's behavior that's the first level and and that's the easiest thing that we see is behavior but what creates the behavior is the question mm -hmm. and so the, what creates the behavior is the story we're telling ourselves. and it's like okay what a story am i telling myself what's create what creates the story i'm telling myself and what they've learned is the story that you're telling yourself is created by an emotion now most aa programs and addict programs they talk about the first two levels what your behavior is and what story you're telling yourself the hardest level to crack is that third one, the emotion. So when you crack that emotion, you go into the belief you have about the world. And the belief you have about the world comes from your original incident. It's called the OI, your trauma. So 
re- every human has an original incident, a trauma that creates your belief about the world. Your belief about the world creates an emotion. Your emotion creates a story you're telling yourself and the story you're telling yourself creates your behavior. So we try to get to the fifth level of like, when was that moment? And it could be something small when you fall off your bike and your dad, you know, says, Hey, get up. I'm not going to help you. And you're just like, Oh my God, the belief about the world is I'm by myself when I get hurt. Or if, you know, my mom was healing from something and I go hug my mom and I didn't know she, I was four years old and everyone yells at me and goes, careful. And I'm like, well, I'm just hugging. I, and so then my, my story is like, oh my gosh, when I love someone, I hurt them. Mm-hmm. And so it could be so small and, and big, obviously, if you lose someone or if your family talked down to you, but to really go into those five levels of like, okay, let's go to the core. But the hardest part about that is you have to go back to that child and you have to go really inward in this meditation and this prayer to re-encounter that five-year-old version of yourself and hold them and support them and know them they're going to be okay. And so a lot of the, the guided meditation prayers we do is really going back to that, that five-year-old self. Um, Cause at the end of the day, people walking around hurting people, they're just a bunch of hurt kids. Totally. And, uh, totally. and so we, the epidemic ep- 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 we have now in America is we have a bunch of boys inside of men's bodies. <laughs> it's like what I always say to my men's groups. I run like men's groups and I was like, we have all these little boys, but they're in 30 year old men's bodies and they don't know how to regulate their systems, their triggers. They, they don't know what they're doing to the feminine energy when they, you know, kind of use them in certain ways. And what I've noticed is, and th- we can go in so many different directions, like with masculine energy. So I don't want to like get too far. Away. I know, like but, so but what many. I, yeah, what I've noticed is the the relationship men have with their mother is so crucial to have the relationship they have with women and the feminine energy. And if they've never really healed that, they continue to hurt women just on the regular. And I've worked with thousands of men for the last ten years too, and that's like a whole different topic conversation. But oh um, gosh, totally. anyway, just really trying to get back to that 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 heart, you know, and that soul of. Uh, Hey, where did, because you know your kids, you know kids are our greatest teachers. Jesus said the only way to enter the kingdom of heaven, which I believe is right now, heaven is, we're supposed to bring heaven to earth. But Jesus was like, the only way to enter the kingdom of heaven is with a childlike spirit. And the reason he said that is because you can't have pride. You can't have knowledge. You can't just, because these these, uh, Pharisees in the Bible would be like, I know scripture and I know the law and I know this. And Jesus is like, hey, these kids over here are your teachers. You're not getting into heaven unless you live like them. And I just love that because we're supposed to return home to that five-year-old self and then live with like this, I mean, literally, um, Scout is like going into the stories of how she's watering all these plants and loving these plants. And I'm like, she's made it. She's, she's made it to the pinnacle of life. All right, guys, are you looking for more plant-based recipes to add into your life and nourish your family? I'm doing a special ebook promotion for my podcast listeners to thank you for all of your support where you can get any of my ebooks for 15% off with the code podcast. Just go to ellenfisher.com slash ebooks and enter the code at checkout to get this deal while it lasts. All three of my ebooks are filled with our family's favorite and staple plant-based recipes that are whole foods focused, nourishing, delicious, and satisfying. Many of these recipes we eat on a weekly or even daily basis, and it's filled with the meals that I found over the years to make my family feel our best, taste and incredible and most of them are quick to whip up in the kitchen too. A family favorite is the vegan lasagna in my epic vegan cravings ebook and also you have to make a big batch of home-baked omega granola which is sure to get eaten within the week. Healthy hummus recipes and a totally decadent springtime lemon poppy cake layered with strawberry jam and cream cheese frosting made from coconut and lemon zest that the kids love for me to make for their birthdays. The linguine parm and vegan zuki which is a chocolate chip skillet cookie topped with the healthiest homemade vanilla ice cream that tastes like it's from a creamery is to die for. And I love making for family dinner every week the hearty red lentil chili from the Epic Plant Bar Kid Food ebook. These ebooks are 100% vegan, whole foods focused, gluten free friendly, and are instant digital downloads that can be read on any smartphone, tablet, or computer. Between all three ebooks, I also include practical tips, encouragement, inspiring content, simple swaps to enhance the health of your meals, a seven day sample meal plan, how to help your children love fruits and vegetables, lunchbox ideas, beginner vegan tips, and more. And I have poured my heart and soul into these books. Between all three ebooks, there's over 460 pages of content and vibrant photography. And each recipe is filled with vibrant whole plant foods for health and wellness in both body and mind. Remember to use the code podcast at checkout for 15% off any or all of my ebooks. I hope you enjoy them and feel inspired to get in the kitchen to make healthy, nourishing plant-based meals. And somewhere along the way, we get distracted and lost and ego and money and traumas come into play. And then literally, if you talk to older people that are past 
50, they're just in the garden watering the plants and they're talking like scouts talking, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is your daughter. I don't know. You know yes, everyone knows yes. that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, because they're starting to realize like, oh, this is this is actually the key. It's not so much what I thought it was as yeah. I was getting into adulthood and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, I, I had so many things. I was like, yes. I was, and then I'm like, wait, where do we even go? <laughs> I know. So many things that you touched on. But I think that inner trauma that you're talking about is so relevant. You would love the um, mind change method, which is my friends, Kent and Heather McKean. I had them on my podcast about how your mind can change everything. And I've done many mind change sessions with my friend Heather. And she's so gracious and loving and doing these with me, which is essentially what you're talking about. Going back to that child self, those one of those moments, finding those moments where you're like, wait, I had no idea that this affected me that much. Or maybe you did, but you just always like pushed it aside. Mm. And you didn't really know how it really related to your adult adult life but you know it affected you and when you think about it, it brings up emotions but when you go back to it and like really let yourself like hold yourself let yourself feel those feelings and then you kind of rewire your brain you rewire your brain to tell yourself what it what it actually could have been or what it meant um to change how you receive that memory in a different mm. way into your adulthood is really really fascinating like it's basically changing your memories yeah. so that you're not um like still dealing with that trauma from what happened when you're younger and i found like just incredible results from doing something like that so i know it's not exactly the same thing but it's similar it's like going back to those traumas and what you experience well yeah i think we i think we all know that we can't think our way out of heartbreak or losing a parent like we we know when we lost our parent or broke our heart from a relationship we like we know it's not forever but we literally cannot knowledge our way out of it and as society in western world has taken this like kind of pride on like oh we can have a pill for anything you want to feel anything you want to if you don't want to feel sadness here's this but you can't think your way out of pain and so no matter how what they've realized in science is that actually 80% of all the information is our body sending information to our brain and most people think it's all of our brain sending into our body and so what they've realized is that trauma is stored in the body like actual energetic like if you have hip problem or back pain they've realized that when that when you fell as a kid or your mom didn't pick you up and say I love you there's a part of your body that holds this trauma mm -hmm. and so when you go into meditation and prayer and really you know, not trying to think your way out because any, anyone smart can know what's wrong with trauma, but you have to refeel it. You have to feel emotions again. And we're emotional beings more than we are cerebral. And I think people think we're cerebral because we can, we're really smart and we've, we've tried really hard. And that's why we're at the tipping point of mental health and the conversation we are because we've literally forced these, these medications to people and we forced uh, the knowledge that we can like put a man on Mars soon, you know? But it's like, wow, we haven't actually figured out this that well yet. Mm -hmm. And so now science, I, what I love right now, the, the renaissance that we're in is spirituality and science were at war for so long. Spirit, you know, Science was like, you can't see love, you can't measure it, it's not real. And spirituality was like love and heart. And now for the first time, what, I've, what I'm seeing is spirituality and science are actually kind of like, hey, we've hit a ceiling and we wanna learn from you. And now to get deeper in your spiritual practice, you need to learn about science. And to get deeper in your scientific awareness, you need to learn more about spirituality. And so there's this huge awakening happening that I've noticed being in those realms for over a decade that I'm excited about. That I'm like, whoa, there, there's machines now that can measure the energy coming off of your heart. Mm -hmm. And there's heart math. I don't know if you've ever heard of heart math at no. UCLA. They, they had, there's like this study, it's been going on for like over a decade now, but basically they hook up these machines to your, to your body and to your brain. And they've realized that there, that, I mean, this is kind of crazy studies, but there's one that there was a machine that wasn't connected to the person and they would tell the person something like, Hey, your car got stolen or they would tell them things. And this, uh, this, it was yogurt that the machine was connected to because there's living uh, probiotics on it and the yogurt would be affected. It would like the energy would move on it and they're not connected to it. That's and then they did one where uh, at HeartMath University, they studied where um, they showed images to a person that was hooked up to the machine brain and heart. And they showed them like a cup, like neutral images, and then a horrific, like a dead body in a car crash. And they realized that three to five seconds before you saw the dead body or the car crash, your heart knew it was going to happen, which wow. is so I'm, that's what I'm, that's what they're trying to figure out. Huh. So like they'll show a cup and nothing happens to your mind or your heart. And then right before, three to five seconds before they show a snake or something 
intense your body would re- your heart would react before your brain could see it wait that's weird i know i i would love to see those studies maybe we can find it and put it in the show notes for people to look at there's in a documentary called i am uh-huh. by tom shadiak one of my mentors uh-huh. and he goes and interviews them and it's probably my favorite doc i've oh, screened cool. it around town oh awesome i am i'm gonna, I am I'm gonna tom to check shadiak. that out yeah um i think that all of that is fascinating i think you're right that we have so much more of our spiritual energy and our emotional energy is it's so much more powerful than we realize like we look at ourselves as bodies and then we have like this you know this place in our heart that is our soul right or this place in our heart that has emotions but really like we are emitting it everywhere and there's a lot of times you can feel a presence of someone and you're like why do i feel so good around this person like what what is going on that it's just like the vibes right like you hear the, the it's a vibe an aura, right? an yeah. aura the vibe. but now machines can measure the aura yeah. you know? and there's still so much that we have to learn and that's not to say that there isn't a place for like um medical prescriptions and drugs. like i just want to make sure to preface that just totally. because of course we're not doctors and there are physicians that are it's very important right to acknowledge something like that but you're so right of the over the over prescription, the over medical use that we have instead of really connecting into a lot of the things that are really just our traumas that we need to heal. It's not for every situation, of course, but, um, and I think going back to that, it reminds me of the difference between the conscious thoughts and the subconscious Mm. thoughts. So when you're saying like the thinking, you can't think your way out of your trauma, right? You can't just be like, I'm just going to heal it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, yep, I'm healing it right now, right? Like it's really, it's deep, deep, deep in that subconscious. Like so many of our thoughts are these subconscious thoughts we don't even know that we're having. So all of that plays a role. Yeah, 90% of all of our thoughts are subconscious. Oh, wow, so, that much. Yeah, 90, so it's like an iceberg. Have you seen like an iceberg, like 10% of the iceberg yeah. shown in underwater? So when you, there's like breath work or plant medicines that are helping people basically just lower the water, because if 90% of all the decisions you make every day are subconscious, then we need to figure out what's going on in the subconscious, because that's a lot. From the outfit you put on to the food you eat to how you treat people or how you think about people, 90% is in is underwater so we need to access that and it helps you i think to have a little more empathy for other people because we when you look around everyone is really just doing what they're doing based on the stories that they've been told throughout their whole life or the stories that have happened to them and it affects how they look at the world like we all literally have these completely different lenses on the world based on our experiences exactly and that is so important when it comes to empathy and like understanding each other yeah yeah you really in the spiritual community you know i'm always trying to encourage you know christians that some come off somewhat judgmental or yeah because even you you saying even you saying the like heaven is here the kingdom like that that's actually quite controversial i don't really normally talk about spiritual i haven't yet touched on that although i would love to i was just i think i was talking to you about how i would love to do an episode with like three different spiritual beliefs and just kind of have a conversation not like a debate but just a conversation like where do we align why do we think the way that we do with like completely different religious beliefs or spiritual outlooks on life and i don't know i think it's really fascinating but i haven't really touched on it yet yeah because even just saying like you just did is quite controversial for people totally yeah and i think you know the goal is the compassion of listening to people and i think christians and and not to like you know like i was a youth pastor for a while and i'm still really close with jesus in my own walk but i think christians have this you know way of shaming people or guilting people and when you tell someone they're wrong for what they believe you actually dehumanize them you you take whatever life experiences they've had to get to where they, what you just said, what they believe about the world, about religion, about God, about politics, and you say, hey, you're wrong, you're dehumanizing their whole life experience. And and you, and you you know, I'm always trying to encourage Christians like, hey, Jesus' two best two qualities was asking questions and listening. Like that was the best thing he was at. And so really just trying to help people, like you said, get more compassionate to where if someone does something heartbreaking, like in the news, and people portray it as like, I'm going to use something maybe controversial, but like a shooter, like a school shooter and, and, you know, or someone just does something bad. You can get really mad at that person and really triggered, or you can just break your heart. Like for that person, like just being like, and I know it's all opinions, but like that school shooter, of course that was really sad what he did. But if you can find this healing in your own heart and just be like, dang, that kid must've been going through something really hard. You've accessed this God level of compassion to just meet people, you know, and it's not okay, but even when if someone like, you know, I, what I said on <clears throat> my Instagram the other day is we, we usually judge people on their worst moments, like their worst thing they've ever done or said, cancel culture. Mm-hmm. And I think if you heal your heart 
and you really go inward, you you see the potential in everyone. And so even I've seen people that have been incarcerated, like arrested and in jail for 10 years become nannies. And I'm like, hell yeah, like there is no, like anything is revival and redemption. Yeah. And so anyway, There's I think- There's no boundaries to no. like your life. Like. To- or I mean, think about it. Yeah, you're interviewing all these people to nanny your kids and you're like, oh, she's Stanford, she's Harvard. And then this person's ex-incarcerated and you immediately be like, oh, that's a no sweetheart like you tell your you know your wife that's a no it's like why is it a no like does not everyone have a chance to become new in life and if we give people these labels and these categories and stigmatized even from job offerings to people that have been incarcerated or anything it's just heartbreaking that and what you said is i remember you did i saw a video or i was listening to something you said about that about how when we give labels to other people that were dehumanizing them like especially because it's so divide it can be quite divisive oh there's a couple things i feel like in this whole conversation the one um how quick we are to criticize others right instead of looking inward and be like what am i doing mm. like instead of focusing on the like oh that person's doing it wrong especially in the age of social media we have this like there's a, there's this this uh, culture now of this justification to be like anyone who's online you are doing it wrong and I'm gonna tell you why X Y and Z right and someone listening might be like well maybe that's hard for you because you are the one online and you're the one receiving the blah 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 but I really think if you take a step back we all can just like look in ourselves and be like what do I what am I doing what can I focus on and what am I gonna be able to put out into the world that's gonna bring betterment exactly. right exactly um, and then the other aspect you said about um, dehumanizing others. Do you feel like it's different if you put the label on yourself? Like, like versus, versus when people are putting labels on others that they haven't given themselves? What do you think? Yeah, I think the duality, just we, we talked about this the other day, you know, the culture of the second I say I am a Democrat, I am a mm-hmm. Trump supporter, I am a Christian, I'm an atheist, we immediately lose the uh, opportunity to just discover something new about someone. And, yeah. and my mentor, Tom Shadyak, the one who made the documentary said, um, definition is the death of discovery. Mm. And um, he also directed like Ace Ventura and uh, Patch Adams and Liar Liar and uh, Bruce Almighty. So he's like, he's he's really good friends with Morgan Freeman, Jim Carrey, and they have these really deep conversations that he always tells me about. But that's one that came up when they had that conversation is definition is the death of discovery. So the moment I hear you believe, you voted for something or you believe in a God, I lose the discovery in just who you are. Mm. I lose the opportunity to to because um, we have a we have a cognitive bias. We it, subconsciously we don't control that. The second someone says I am a blank or I voted for blank, we have no control over our subcon unless you're really healed. Yeah. <laughs> we have no control over our subconscious bias to immediately be like, oh, they're this. Yep. And so we lose all discovery in who they are, and so. You know, the goal is to get away from this duality, away from this black and white, away from this, like, if you're, if, I think we talked about it, you know, if you disagree with me, we're not friends. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And well, how that's heartbreaking just, that's that is. just what's happened in our culture right now. And I've talked about it, you know, a lot on this podcast, just about like meeting people where they're at, like not being so quick to like, look at if this person did this or that or says whatever, voted for this, whatever, like, d- that doesn't mean that there are all these other things, I know. you know, to just assume. But you're right when you put the labels on that. I kind of struggle with that because there's certain labels that I do like for myself. Like I like calling myself vegan. Mm-hmm. But you're right when you say that there are other people. Other people are going to have different stigmas in their own brain of what they think vegan means. Yeah. You know, so you can like that label for yourself, but what are you limiting in that other person when you speak to them and they already have their preconceived notions and ideas on what it means if you're vegan. If you're vegan, that means you're this, this, or that. Or maybe there's a time if I'll come out saying like, this is something I believe in, and then people will assume, well, if you believe in this, and that means you must believe in all these other things. And I'm like, wait a wait, wait a second, I haven't even talked about any of that. Yeah. You don't know what I think about that. And so that's why I think the gray is so, so helpful as opposed to just these black and white and these dualities of good, bad, right, wrong. Especially, but I think especially if someone's putting on a label for someone else that they haven't even like outwardly given themselves is, is especially harmful. But I do see what you mean, even just the labels in general. But sometimes there's help helpful conversation right when you're like navigating a topic but but i guess it's better to just have a broader conversation instead of just using a word right yeah some words are charged obviously more than others veganism and christianity have always been like similar boats you know where it just you immediately think shame or judgmental like you can be at dinner with friends and 
you're just like, oh, do you have anything plant-based on the menu? And everyone's like feels judged already. And you're like, wait, what? I didn't judge any of yeah. you, but they, th- yeah, right. The word is charged. But they might have that from a past experience exactly. of someone who did judge them or maybe something they've watched on TV about a vegan or yeah. <laughs> something like yeah. that, like a movie that portrayed a vegan in a certain way yeah. and things like that. So it so, all plays into their story. Totally. So trying your best, like I said, always go inward, but it just instead of being, you know, you know, fight or flight mode with even when someone's like, I'm a Christian, you're like, Oh my God, you're judging me. I'm a vegan. Oh my God, you're judging me. It's more of just being like, Oh, why, why is that? You know, why, why is that? And you know, I love the, you know, even vegan because it's some people for animals, some people it's the health, some people it's, um, the environment. So, you know, just being curious always, no matter if they voted for someone or believe something with that word, just realizing why you gave it charge. Like you gave a charged experience for that word, which is heartbreaking that like mm-hmm. Christians, literally when you think of the word Christian, you think of judgmental, shame, hating people. And you think of Jesus, you're like, wow, that guy was really loving and like washed people's feet and like loved people really well that he shouldn't have been talking to. And so you're like, what? and vegans, you know, so anyway, it's like, yeah. Just always coming back to like, I think internet has definitely blown it up where, you know, like if you have a car, like we were saying last night, if you sit with anyone, uh, rather, regardless of what they believe or who they voted for, um, from guns to anything like that, you'll most likely have 80% more in common than differences. That is exactly what I'm always trying to say. I'm like, instead of just being like, oh, you have this, you, you, you're this, right? You're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're this, you vote this person, like you're just saying, it, it be curious. Like yeah. you're saying, like, why do you think that? Because more likely than not, you're going to find out that, oh, I get how they got there. I exactly. get why they think the way that they do. Even if at the end of the day, you don't agree with it, exactly. you can still be like, I understand why they got there and why they think that way. And it might, you might, learn something you might realize oh actually i didn't know that about that i should consider that aspect and then just being more in the gray of understanding yeah all that stuff so where does this play a role with our traumas because do you feel like a lot of these judgments that you know we live in the society we're just like casting judgment here and there left and right over everything what is it that causes that is some of it related to our unresolved trauma yeah all of it i would say it's you know like the idea that concept that we're you know kids are taught hate, are taught judgment, are taught these things from either culture or from their circles. But yeah, I think it all comes from trauma. So it all comes back to healing the words. You know, when you're, I would say, uh, Scout, you know, at her age, she goes to a playground. She doesn't care what skin color or who they voted for or what car they came in. She's just playing with this kid. And it's just this purity of like, um, yo, if you fall and cut yourself, I'll go tell my mommy you need a bandit. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to help each other. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, we get in this fight or flight mode where we, uh, our egos come up and we're like, oh, I have to look out for myself. I have to protect myself. And it's biological and cultural. Cultural, totally. Because a lot of it is like, it's such a um, huge responsibility to raise children. Like huge, because all of your traumas are Put, like pouring out onto them, right? If you're all, not healed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you're not healed. I mean, has, is anyone ever fully healed, right? Like we all have these little things that totally. we're just like, that we can work on still. And so when you say something that maybe, like you said, even about the car, right? Like a child who's never thinking about someone's car, but if they hear from an adult saying something about the value of someone with a nice car or like, ooh, that nice car, like that person has this, then you start telling that story to that child, like, oh, you're more valuable if you have a nice car, totally. that type of thing. Sorry, keep going. No, yeah, so just coming back to, uh, yeah, where, it's fight or flight, so basically, so what I always tell people is there's three wheels. There's cultural, biological, and then soul, your heart, your true essence. And the front wheel, like a tricycle, is either leading those two wheels, or, um, so either your biology is leading your soul and your cultural two wheels, or your soul is leading your biology and culture. So always coming back to when you make a decision about your life. Biologically, women are like, I need to get married, right, I need to have kids. And then culture, like, oh, I need to have a job. I need to have money, security. But if you put your soul and your heart and your truth at the front wheel of the tricycle and it's pulling the other two, you'll always notice there's a more pure alignment. Um, and so always coming back to like, is this is this reaction of if I'm dating this girl or I'm raising my kid or I'm making a job description, is it cultural, biological or my soul, my truth, my 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 love, you know, my purity? Um, and then really trying to just navigate that and, and going back to all decisions we make. Um, and a lot of it obviously has to do with our, our upbringing, our traumas, our experiences we've had. Um, so always having compassion for anyone. Like they, they're going into prison systems now and they're literally teaching vulnerability and compassion and empathy and giving them like poetry and creativity to like express this and not just write them off of like, oh, they're, a, they're um, just a number in a system and they're no longer benefit to society Mm -hmm. and now they're going like well let's go you know rehab this 
this uh, this heart, this little kid, you know? Yeah, we talked about the prison system issues with um, my friend Dominic Thompson. That episode was so fascinating. Oh, I can't wait to to it. Yeah, I recommend anyone listening to go check that out because there's so many issues, like you said, with the prison system. This idea that like, oh, you committed this crime or you did this wrong, and then that means we just put you here and instead of actually like, what's going to help heal the heart? Yeah, right. And that's what they're doing. And so, you know, and that's why I work with kids for so long is because, yeah, you know, you can, and I worked with inner city kids. So I I basically moved to the east side of Denver, which is the inner city, like urban area. And I started mentoring a group of uh, 20 students. And I spent five years with them almost uh, every day and really just uh, became brothers and um, just simplified like my my purpose on the world like people want to solve like they everyone wants to say, i want to change the world i want to change the world i want to i want to do big things and it's like yeah well do you want to go do the dishes for your mom and they're like no i want to change the world and it's like that's changing the world like you have to humble and i and i'm so honored that people want to change the world that's beautiful but you almost become paralyzed because you're like wait i have to feed a billion people and give water to a billion it's like hey just simplify it go do this for your mom you know, go inward on yourself, become the purpose. Like the, the purpose is never external. You become the, the, um, you become purpose and you become in alignment with whether your kid is crying on the playground or you see a kid that his mom is somewhere and he's crying. You're going to help that kid crying. Right. And so you become just love in any situation where you're not being like, I can't go protect that kid that just cut his knee because I need to watch out for my kid. It's like, no, that kid cut his knee. His mom's not with him. You're going to go love him. And somewhere along the way, we've, we've learned to be mad at, you know, if I, if my, if my, if I cut my left hand, my right hand is not going to be like, Hey, you're doing bad. I don't like you. And I'm not going to help you carry things. My right hand's going to have empathy and help, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? And so we're all connected. And I know that might sound woo woo to some people or spiritual. Um, but a lot of people are just in fight or flight mode. They're triggered because um, these traumas, these moments in their life. And the biological, and you said cultural, but the biology, so when we're in junior high, um, we, and high school, and our life, when we make a mistake, we think that this tribe could kick us out and we can die. And so our ego is, obviously when we were cavemen and there was animals that can kill us everywhere, our ego was like, okay, don't go out this time and build a hut like this and build a weapon like this. And so our ego was always trying to protect us. And so this is because we could die. (laughs) And so our ego um, was overflowed into our now brains now, which if I am dancing in seventh grade in front of all these kids and they make fun of me, my ego goes, okay, note to self, never dance in public again, because if they shun you, if they push you out of the tribe, you'll die. Like that's literally what's biologically happening. And they've proven this with this, with the subconscious and the science. And so then we, um, we stop dancing in front of people and we stop singing in front of people. And I would, I always use this analogy that I would go to elementary schools and speak and I'd raise, I'd be like, raise your hand if you can sing and all the kids shoot up. I'm raise your hand if you can dance, all the kids hands shoot up. And then I go speak at a high school with a thousand kids. I'm like, raise your hand if you can sing. And maybe one kid, raise your hand if you can dance like one kid. And (laughs) somewhere along the way, we lost the freedom of like your kids just dancing and singing and having fun. And, um, Wow, what an amazing comparison. Yeah, it's wild. I've done it many times and it's just like, man, it's heartbreaking. And so my goal and and now what's happening with this movement of 35 and 40 and 45 year olds, they've been through divorce and bankruptcy and mental health. And now 40 year olds are like, wow, I got to go do the work. I have to go inward. I have to forgive my five year old self, forgive my parents, heal this bitterness that I have, this chip on my shoulder. And I mean, there's so many movements now that are happening. And so my goal is to help people not go 35 and 40 years before they do it. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's been a journey. I think your, um, compare your example of wanting to change the world, but looking at like maybe too broad of a scale or too grand of a gesture. Right. Um, but then bringing it back down to your daily life and what you're doing and to just do it, to be compassionate, to really like focus on like how you can be more loving and compassionate. I think it's a a really good way to put it. And it's really helpful because it starts within your daily practices, Mm. your daily choices and how you speak to others and how you speak to yourself and how you help others and what you eat. Yeah. All of it, all of it. And your, your daily habits with your life and how you what's the word um to become more intentional yes you know from how you eat to you know how long little things how long you shower maybe to just being more mindful of how you approach life and i think nature like is the greatest teacher of that like if you go sit in nature and really become i call it sobering your soul and so when you sober your soul you're not drunk off of buying things or drunk off of followers or instagram likes 
and you sober your soul and you sit in nature and you go, wow, they're all working together. The birds and the trees and the animals, the insects, like all of them are working together and they're not at war with themselves. And this tree, they've scientifically proven this, that the trees that connect under the ground will give water to other trees and they will like support each other. And so nature for me is God, like his church is everything. Like you go into nature and that's when you find this plant-based diet where you're like, whoa, like, you know, the, everything is vibrational and there's this documentary called thrive and thrive Two. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, No. but this new one that just came out, they zoom in on an atom and they zoom in all the way on the, they're like the, as much as you can zoom in on an atom of the electrons and, and protons and it's all vibrating. And so when you look at the atoms that create us and nature and animals is all a vibration. I think if we can really, I call it the divine dance where I'm like, okay, they're not chaotic, they're dancing. And everything is poetry in motion from like a flower blooming. Like the tulip doesn't get jealous of the rose. They're both beautiful, you know? And so for me, it's, and I don't want to sound woo woo or too spiritual for certain people listening, but like to really be like, oh, it's all a divine dance that we're in with spirit, with God, with nature, with each other. And if you can zoom in, science have can zoom in on the vibrational movement of an atom of what we're created of, then we could probably figure out how to meditate and lay in nature and ground more. And so, yeah, I love the movement that we're in where science is now like proving spirituality proving, has yeah. valid, you know. Right. I mean, I don't feel like what you said is too woohoo at all. But again, going back to the everyone's story, someone else listening might find it too woohoo totally. or might find it even triggering or even might want to turn it off. Like someone who might be like, oh, this guy, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? This guy using the word Christian, but he's not a Christian and want to click it off, right? Or maybe even the opposite. Someone who's like, maybe at first, maybe their own story tells them, oh, this guy is a Christian. I'm not a Christian. Christian, and so I'm going to turn it off, right? Little things like that. Yeah. But I feel like it's help. I don't know. Can we talk about like truths? Like, you know, the my truth versus one truth mm. versus multiple truths at the same time. I find that topic really fascinating because I tend not to like the my truth thing. Like, this is my truth. This is your truth. Only because I do believe that there is like one truth for like a lot of things. But at the same time, you can also have multiple truths for certain things. So like totally. I can listen to this, what you just said about nature and God and and how we can connect and how it's all so much more infinitely detailed than we our minds could possibly fathom, right? And how our energies, it's all interconnected with, I mean, I believe divine purpose, but there's also this other aspect of like someone who might speak on a more philosophical, theological level with a, a spiritual text or religion that you can kind of be like, okay, there is a truth to these different aspects. I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, like totally. Like you can kind of, I can see the value in listening to, to both and like finding value from it. But also I do believe in like single truths for a lot of things. Does that even make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I think, and like, once again, it's a dance. It's, it's a, it's a conversation. It's an, an emotion where, um, yeah, I, I was, I lived with monks for a while throughout Asia and throughout Thailand and Japan. I was like living with monks. I lived with Muslims throughout the Middle East and you know growing up in america where i wasn't really raised christian like my parents never brought us to church and stuff like that but i knew what christianity was i really was like and i was living with these these different religions and beliefs i was like well the human experience is pretty fascinating and for me to just box it up and you know say this is this without evolving like the moment you think you have it figured out is the moment you lose um the invitation to life and love and and you're saying you have the truth you know and so and it's a dance. I know it's a dance because there is certain truths um, and then there's certain personal truths. But to always be open and excited and encouraged to just never stop learning. And the yeah. moment you stop learning is when you're dead. Like you're yeah. just done. <laughs> yeah. if, and I always tell Christians this. And I, and I have such a, I mean, I've, I've never really fit in. So for over a decade, I've been kicked out of churches. And then the spiritual community would be like, oh, he likes Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You don't belong here. And then yeah. the church would be like, oh, you, you, you know, talk about astrology or ask questions about Jesus you're not fit in and so I've literally never fit in for over a decade mm. and so I created my own kind of thing where I started hosting events and basically what I always encourage people is create what you can't find from events from content like maybe when you started making content you were like I can't find a, a youtuber that has a family that's plant-based and this and I can't find a podcast that's this and so create what you can't find so I started throwing events that were both of those things. I started hosting um, programs that were both of those things. And I was so blown away at the amount of people that showed up because it's not one or the other. And so I'm, basically it's a pendulum. 
And so there's Christians over here and everything is Christian. And then over here is like, you know, woo woo, spiritual yeah. freedom. And then I'm always just like, hey, whatever you believe is okay, but just come to the middle and challenge yourself. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. the only thing I care about. That's I the care. best way to say yeah. it. Yeah. Just like you're over here and you don't, you hate the word God, you hate the Bible, you hate church, you know, and then Christians like, I hate spirituality and meditation and yoga. And it's like, okay, okay. Yeah. Just come to the middle <laughs> and learn and soften your heart. And I would always tell Christians like, if you only believe in this thing and you have the ultimate truth, it's like swimming in a fishbowl in the ocean where like you're swimming, you're in the fishbowl and you're like, oh, it's a cool fishbowl. And then the ocean is around you and you're just staying in the fishbowl. And so I'm always like, yo, come out of the fishbowl. It's safe. You're okay. You're not going to, if you do yoga or meditate, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. There are, there are Christians who are like yoga is of the yeah, devil. Like you can't even. Tons. Yeah. And so I've been so fortunate. My retreats and my programs I run, I, I do it all. I do both. I, we pray and we meditate and do yoga and, you know, talk about the Holy Spirit and God. Um, but for me, it's it's just you can't describe it. And so um, someone asked me the other day, like, PC, they, they just kind of rediscovered their spirituality practice with God and, and with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And and they were like, um, BC, how do I explain this to people? Like, how do I tell my dad that he doesn't like this stuff? How do I tell my friends? And I was like, the best way to explain this to you is imagine your favorite song, like what your favorite song is. And it gives you goosebumps. It makes you cry. It like makes you, you want to dance. Like your favorite song can turn your worst day into your best day. It's a miracle, right? It's a, it's a music. And then imagine me trying to explain my favorite song to you without showing and expecting you to have the same emotion. Mm. So I'm like, I'm like, Ellen, Ellen, there's this song. It, I just <laughs> cried and I had goosebumps. It went doo doo doo, boop boop boop. Doo. And there's this piano and saxophone. I'm like, why aren't you crying? And you'd be like, you'd be like, you're just making sounds. You sound dumb. Oh I'd be my like, God. wait, you have to cry or you or you're wrong. You know what I'm saying? And it's a song that they'll never hear. But the only thing they'll see is how I dance, which is loving people. And the song I'm listening to, my spiritual experience with God, is my dance, aka how I love people. And one day someone's gonna be like, hey, what song are you dancing to? Because how you love people is really powerful. And like, that's it, right? Um, you explained that amazingly. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew you were, I, I could tell where you're going with that halfway through. I'm like, oh, because it's about who you are and how you're acting exactly. and what's coming out. Yeah, that's so interesting. I have a little funny story that's kind of related to what you're talking about. Um, I was raised in a, in a really Christian home. And then as I got older, like I came here and I made a friend and she was telling me about how she was going to this um, universal worship. And I was like, what? is that and she was telling me how they read these different religious texts from all these they read different portions from different religious texts in like a group and they put it on a table and i was like well isn't that just kind of taking from the parts that you like and not using the parts that you don't like and she's like well yeah and i was just very i never met someone like that so i was just very curious and i think the word curious and challenging yourself is really important and at the end of the day you could hear this and be like no i don't agree with that that's totally fine but for for the purpose of i think this portion of the conversation is like be curious and challenge yourself and so i was like asking your questions and i'm like Okay, but this is what I hear when I see this. Like, what I see is like, okay, there's a mango tree outside. And like, that's what it is. It's a mango tree. And someone goes, no, I think it's a banana plant. And someone's like, no, I think it's an avocado tree. And someone's like, well, no, I think it's actually a papaya. And then, and then I'm like, so then how can you just say it's all of it when it's just a mango tree? And she's like, well, I just look at it and I just say it's beautiful. And I was like, what? Like, it just totally threw me off. Yeah. I did not expect her to give that answer. And I went to bed just like, just dumbfounded. <laughs> like I was, yeah. just, I was just cool. I just had nothing to say. I was just like, that is a really interesting way to look at it. And you know, I I did learn something from that. And there's a you know whether you agree with that or not, which either way, right? At the end of the day, you can be like, okay, maybe we don't. None of us know. And we're all going to die and be like, wow, none of us really know. Like, yeah. And maybe you'd be like, nope, I don't agree with that either. And that's fine. But I think just being curious and open to listening is, and I humble. don't know, half, yeah. the, half the fun. <laughs> yeah, you have to remain humble. And you have to, you have to really come to every situation. Yeah, curious and humble and just willing to, um, you know, humans with the ego, we're not really good at being wrong. Right. You know? Yeah, and we want to be right. Yeah. And I went into that wanting to be right. Like, I was like, look, I'm going to prove it wrong. I'm going to show her, look how silly this is. I'm going to be like, look, this is silly. Like, it's just a mango tree. So you got to figure out which one it is, right? Yeah. But she was like, oh, I just look at it and I think it's beautiful. And I just did not know what to say. I was just dumbfounded. I was like completely silent. And I was like, okay, hmm, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a pastor named Judah Smith um, who was our pastor in LA. And he... 
he did a whole series, like seven weeks of what I wish pastors would say, AKA what I wish Christians would say. And there was like a whole episode on like, I don't know, like just saying, I don't know. And I was wrong and I'm not okay. And like all these things of like, you know, just bringing in the, the mental health conversation into, you know, certain doctrines and things that, you know, have just become, uh, politicized, weaponized and, and just being humble and just being like, Whoa, I didn't know the, that's who formed the Bible. Like, I don't know. I didn't know that the, the, the meeting in, uh, in Rome of when they created the Bible was this, these men that had an agenda, you know what I'm saying? Like, and not to attack it, but I'm just saying, I, I didn't know this, you know, I didn't know certain things and just always having an open heart to at the end of the day. And like you said, is how do you show up and love people? That's it. That's, that is the only thing of like what is working for you like the recipe and the formula you know and that was actually one reason why i was so interested in what she was saying because she really was someone i had met that i had never met someone like her like mm. she was just emanating this different type of vibration off of her i was like she's so this and this and oh in a positive way right and that's why i was asking her questions so i was like what's going on yeah. <laughs> but all that to say just like i think just seeking after seeking after it right and being open to it i did not expect it to go in this direction spiritually i know I yeah <laughs> i mean it's all connected when it because i feel like to be honest most of the trauma people i work with is the catholic church and raised and being raised mm. christian a lot of the shame a lot of the guilt a lot of the judgment a lot of the uh, limiting beliefs came from the doctrine that they were raised in these really intense judgmental spaces where the, even like being liberated from their sexuality being liberated from their definitions being liberated from you know these things that have bonded them um and so all of it's tied together uh mm -hmm. from spiritual spirituality to um lack of uh you know love or support growing up as a kid but it's all connected and i think a lot of people listening will probably resonate to be like that's yeah. how i was raised i was raised where you know you couldn't talk about sex you couldn't ask about questions you couldn't do anything and like i'm i'm saying like I'm going to throw in the summer out there, but I would say 60, I would say more than half. I would say 60, maybe 70% of the thousands of people I've worked with for 14 years have had religious trauma, like more than half. But there's also people who are, who have the opposite experience where they didn't, weren't really as religious at all. And then they come into Christianity and have really totally. found a lot of, so it's like everyone's experience is so exactly. different. Exactly. Yeah. I've, and I've danced with all of it, you know, and, and, and yeah, like my goal is, is I'm not God or Jesus or, you know, the Holy Spirit. My goal is to just help you quiet you know yourself and really guide you through this inner child this inner moment this you know this disconnection from yourself because you have all the answers you have god within you like it says in the bible like the the spirit of god is within every heart every single human being has it the kingdom within them and so you know and jesus taught a lot of this but it got lost in translation and it got lost in like this separated the separation you know but jesus was like you can do everything i can do and more like you're just as powerful as me and so always coming, you know, letting, you know, these religious people that have um, compartmentalized this control into being liberated and just being like, yo, Jesus was hanging out with people who he wasn't allowed to hang out with and washing people's feet and doing things. And so anyway, I think a lot of the divide that happens in politics and religion is kind of the divide that happens in humanity. Um, if you really sit back and go, well, if we got rid of religion and politics, we would be pretty like... Um, unified in certain ways and not to be i don't want to like make people feel bad for politics religion but just to open up the conversation <laughs> yeah no totally and that's why i would really love to do an episode i don't know how i'd get three people together or four people easy. i think people would love it i think it would be super fascinating to find people with like different religious beliefs and just be like look where's the common ground or like why do you think the way that you do and mm -hmm. Because I, I just find it fascinating. It's kind of daunting. Like there's just so much information sometimes. Yeah, those are there's some rabbit holes you can get down in politics and religion where you're like, oh, okay, I'm totally lost now. Um, but to always come back, and that's like from anything from the news to media to what's wrong with the world to what's wrong with X, Y, and Z to just be like, okay, this is the only world I can control. The only world I have control over is my internal world. So if I can only control this one, I can't control the stock market. I can't control the how much money we print. I can't control this. If I can control only this one, I better figure out this one. And um, and that's why I'm just always bringing people to like, yo, figure out this internal world you have. Um, the greatest distance any person will ever travel is only 18 inches from your head to your heart. And I always tell that to my students in my high school programs. Like, yo, you want to go on the best adventure ever? Connect your brain and your heart together. Mm -hmm. And you'll find adventure for the rest of your life. Um, and uh, yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Okay, so 
another question, pivoting a little bit. Yeah. How do people identify their pain and how do they turn it into purpose? And like when they're like learning like why they're anxious, why they're hurt and turning it into something beautiful, like helping others. How do you do that? Yeah, well, I think we all have purpose. I think we all have a reason we're here. Like there should be obviously, you know, um, but when you go inward and you find out these moments that disconnected you from joy or music or nature or your family and you heal it, you realign it, you have immense amount of compassion for all humans um, and for yourself. And then you realize that a lot of people out there don't have a mentor or um, a person that believes in them or supports them and so, or a loving person in their life. And so you you uh, alchemize. I don't know if you've ever heard of the movie, book The Alchemist. No. Um, oh, wait, yeah. No, I have heard of yeah, that. Yeah, it's a classic. But you alchemize all this pain and tragedy to where we, you know, you could play a victim the rest of your life. You could be like, yo, my dad didn't show up. My dad didn't, my mom didn't hold me. X, Y, and Z. Like, I have so I have a million excuses why I can't live my dream or love people or, you know, live my, I have a million excuses. And once you heal and you go in, you go, whoa, I have a million things to be grateful for. I have a healthy body. I have, I have X, Y, and Z, you know, and then you, you, transcend all of that pain into helping others and that's literally the whole circle of life that's every movie that we love it's called the hero's journey and every single movie that we love um, has a tragedy has a disconnecting moment where star wars luke skywalker's parents died or dorothy got swept away from a tornado like everyone has a hero's journey they realize that they're the hero of their own journey as well and that the reason we love these movies and these tv shows is it connects to us and so we come back home in the hero's journey. Joseph Campbell created this whole algorithm and formula around it um, is really coming back to like, oh, now I get to live my life for other people. So I never had X, Y, and Z in high school. So I became the best, I don't want to cuss, but the best mentor I could ever become. Like I loved these kids. Like I wish I loved myself in high school. So what I did is I time traveled. So basically when you go into the quantum healing of life and love is you time travel to where I was crying myself to sleep in high school. I was so lonely. I was so depressed. I never fit in. No one ever complimented how I looked and encouraged me on my brain or like my lack of, whatever, you know, just encouraged me. Yeah. So what I do is I go into high schools and I do that for that, these kids. I love them and support them, encourage them, build relationships. And what I'm doing is I'm time traveling so I can help my high school self. Yeah, you're healing from what yeah. you didn't get. Yeah, you can change the past and what you did the brain. I think you can truly change the past. People say you can't change the past. Oh, you can. Yeah. You can go into the quantum healing of like, now a 15 year old kid doesn't have to cry himself to sleep or take his life or take medication because he was loved because I wasn't loved. And so like I could play the victim. I wasn't loved, I never fit in. Or I could play, you know, the support in someone's life and yeah. yeah, there's a difference between being a victim to an experience, something that happened to you versus living in victimhood Yeah, and living in victimhood state your whole life, like saying, I can't do this because of this, this and this and X, Y, and Z. There's a, there's a big difference if you look at someone who's living in victimhood versus a victor mentality and what the outcome is in their life because different traumas are going to shape you and are going to happen, but how you respond to them is what matters the most. Yeah. Yeah. We're not a victim to, cause alcoholism runs in the family. We're a victim to the trauma of why alcoholism runs in the family. You know, even when kids hear that they're bad at school or they've scientifically proven that when a kid hears the parents going, Oh yeah, he's really shy or he's really sad. The chem So the reason where there's chemical imbalances in our brain from ADD to anything, they've scientifically proven that it's because of the story we're telling ourselves. So literally the chemical imbalance isn't from um, the chemistry of our uh, ancestors. It's because of what we're being told, that we're creating our own reality. Yeah, and that's why what I was saying before about how huge a responsibility it is when you're raising kids to work on yourself because mm. you're projecting all your past traumas on your yeah. kids with the little things that you say, you don't even realize it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, you, the the ongoing healing journey, no one no one reaches the ultimate, you know, consciousness nirvana like, you know, if you did then yeah, you're missing out on just being human again. And so be human, like go through your heartbreak with the relationships, go through your, your mourning for your dad being, you know, passing away and go through these things. Um, but always come back to, to, I can help someone now. I can, I can really, uh, I, I'm a soul experiencing a human, not a human experiencing, you know, this emptiness. So do you kind of feel like based on what you're saying that with your traumas, a way to heal is to go and help those that are potentially experiencing that totally. same trauma you had, yeah. or do you heal yourself first and then go help them? So that's a beautiful question. So, so there's this, there's this thing that goes around a lot that I always challenge people on, but people are like, you can't pour from an empty cup. 
So everyone says, you can't pour, focus on yourself first, feed yourself first, and I believe that, I support that, if you believe that, I love you. <laughs> and, I would say, not but, but and, I think helping people is what fills your cup. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people are like, okay, when I find my wife, then I'll volunteer for kids. When I get my money, then I'll donate to charities. I think purpose is when you help people and you donate before you have all your shit figured out, your life becomes magnetically in line with just love and life to where like I was never looking for a wife. I was living in my lane in my life and magnetically she came to me in this beautiful way and I was never looking for money. Money was never the goal, but it came to me from living in this alignment. And so I showed up with an empty cup um, because I, you, look at the richest people look at the most fittest like ask the richest person in the way that you know hey are you extremely happy all the time they're like hell no ask the fittest person that you know hey do you feel sexy all the time they're like hell no you know what i'm saying ask the model that you know do you feel gorgeous all the time all of them are saying no so basically what we've learned is the algorithm we've been given the formula of get your money first get your lover first and get your house first and get yourself first isn't working and so i think offering another option of like hey find ways to heal yourself and heal people and, and support people and i think the money will come i think the lover will come i think the friendships will come yes i totally agree yeah. with that i think there's kind of like a duality to, to that topic of you can't pour from an empty cup because you know on a micro level like on a day-to-day -day basis if i'm not taking care of myself oh, i'm man. like i'm gonna become a cranky mom yeah. you know like i need to i need to have 20 minutes to myself you know something for myself every day i need to feed myself well i need to yeah. make myself a priority in that aspect in order for me to be my best self to my kids and to my husband and, and everything like that i need to take time with my friends but on this other macro level it's almost like a bigger macro level like you're the purpose that you're living the day-to-day -day things maybe not day-to-day -day, but the bigger level is what I can see what you're saying about not needing to get everything together first in order for you to do anything to help others exactly yeah so I feel like it's kind of like both I totally. can, I can see oh both. yeah I mean I, for me it's just a, it's offering another idea yeah to no but it's you, a really good point because yeah. there's this there's off there's actually this um a uh, really common popular thing right now that's like, you know, cut toxic people out of your life. Like anyone who's like not, you know, this perfect uplifting friend, basically someone who's giving you everything you want all the time or isn't exactly making you feel greatest when you're around them, cut them out of your life. And I see the purpose in something like that because you know if boundaries. you if you boundaries right healthy boundaries with people there are certain boundaries that you have to have with you know okay, I cannot have that going on right but then there's also this other idea that I had watched this video by my actually my friend Dr. Gemma Newman I had her on the podcast her husband made this video about how we would never say that with like anything else in the world if like our governments were like all the rich people stop helping the poor people mm -hmm. all those people who are doing well mentally stop helping those who aren't mentally well mm -hmm. but we do that with our own lives like right now it's just so popular on social media and it gives an excuse to let's just not help others or to not um, be there for others because of the sake of your own right like easiness and comfort in your life and so there's kind of a boundary right like, I and mean, there's kind of a balance i mean totally yeah and that's a lot of what i talk about in my programs too because um there's a lot of spiritual people who are you know woke and tapped in and so you know uh, smart online but then they, you go home with their families and they're triggered and they're yelling at their mom and they're talking shit about their brother and you're just like wait are that and i always yeah. say like, like are you the full circle of your healing journey is you go home and you alchemize the relationship with your family. And I thought I was so tapped in because I was loving people and changing people's lives. And, and then I would go home and be triggered by my sister, my mom, my dad. And I was like, oh, I'm just a bullshitter. I'm just like, and boundary, I get boundaries. Like if your family's attacking you, I get it. But like, like abuse and like, totally, totally. I get boundaries. And you'll know when someone, when someone's in a romantic relationship or with their family, you'll know how much work they've done. And I just always joke with like these spiritual gurus because, you know, so many people can be so inspiring and, and line, but then you see them in their romantic partner and they're like cussing at their person. And, and, you know, I'm just saying and it's a joke, but, but basically, you know, the full circle, your journey is going where your traumas were birthed, where they came from. Why is your si sister and brother so triggering? Why is, why can you tap into this alignment and then you're, you know, the Zen and change, you know, inspire people on a podcast, but then your mom and dad say something and you're just triggered. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yo, go heal that. And you'll see how much healing you need to do. So for instance, my sister, this is kind of a personal story, but you know, I, a year ago, a year and a half ago, if you told I couldn't spend more than 30 seconds with my sister. It's just, it's just really intense energy, super opposing, super high level kind of energy. 
And um, then I'm leading a retreat last year. And at my retreat, I'm about to host a workshop on vulnerability. And I get a text that my sister is like about to try to take her life, like really intense situation. And I get really emotional. And then, uh, yeah, sorry. No, um, don't so, be sorry. Don't so be then, sorry. Yeah. So then for me, I'm like, oh man, like what am I doing? Like my head so far, my ass that like I, you know, I'm going to miss the point of all of it. And so I moved back home with, to Denver just to, you know, love on my sister. And, and it wasn't, I needed to change my sister. I needed to change my lens on my sister. Mm-hmm. And, sorry. Oh my God, don't be sorry. Um, I totally cried in my last yeah, episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so and the, I'm the, crying now. I cry as soon as yeah. I hear, as soon as I see someone else crying, I cry. <laughs> the lens on my mom, the lens on my dad, the lens on my sister, that's what needed to change, not them. And so we think so much like, okay, I can, I'll love my mom and my sister and my dad when they change. That's not how love works. And so yeah. I changed the lens on how I see my sister and I couldn't spend 30 seconds with her, you know, a year and a half ago. Now we work out together. I'll go to, I'll go over on Saturday to her house and like clean her house with her. And, and that's a miracle to me because I can love people who love me. That's really that's easy. freaking easy. Yeah. But to love someone who's extremely challenging is the ultimate epitome of love, unconditional love. That's what love is. It's the highest frequency of, of unconditioned. And so for me, it was the ultimate challenge. And so um, I had to take my head on my ass and be like, all right, let's see if you can preach what you, or live what you preach. So now we're great friends. We hang out all the time. We work out together. And she hasn't changed. Well, she's she's healthier now, but she hasn't, nothing about her has changed. I had to change the lens. Yeah. And so anyway, I just always want to encourage people to, you know, it, it is boundaries. I get it. Like I know if you have abusive verbally or physically family members or people in your relationship, like have boundaries, but also figure out your triggers point to your freedom and so what triggers you from your mom your dad your sister actually hold the keys to your heart um and to your liberation and so yeah to always encourage people to go inward thanks for sharing that yeah. that's like i feel very honored that you got to share that or that you were willing to share that and yeah. thank you for that story because it's a perfect example of how often relationships based on this story that we're told on social it mainly seems like i'm seeing it on social media of just cut toxic people out of your life which again to reiterate of course there are boundaries there are certain situations that are essential and necessary um, but a lot of times i feel like that kind of message is used as a crutch to be like look anytime i'm uncomfortable mm-hmm. anytime i feel like maybe i go through a challenging experience with a friend or someone in my life um for my own sake for my own mental health i need to cut that person out of my life but is that really the answer or is actually searching in your soul and be like where can i learn from the situation and how can we come together and actually heal from whatever happened Mm. is that the answer you know and maybe you don't have to be best friends with the person but healing from that experience as opposed to just cutting someone out of your life for the in the name of mental health right but then there's also the understanding of like some people really are struggling mentally and some people can't handle as much as maybe the next person so maybe one person can be like i don't understand like why can't we just have a conversation whereas the next person truly is struggling like with their mental health in a way that maybe the other person will never understand so just trying to understand that other person yeah totally yeah same same with medication right so like i I get the medication, you know, when you're trying to show up to work or school, you need something to help with the, with what you're going through, but it's not the answer, right? So it's, it's just like, it's, 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 there's something deeper going in, you know, where it's like, it helps you get above water so you can function in a culture and a society, but to really, it's like a bandaid over a really deep wound. And so the trauma is the wound. And, and sometimes I'm not all situation, but a lot of times the, the pharma medication can just be a bandaid and this wound's still bleeding, but the bandaid's holding it back. But that's because you don't have time or resources or capacity to figure the wound out. Mm. And so, yeah, it, it definitely comes back to always just, you know, yourself and, and, um, being sovereign within yourself. Like you said, like being free and liberated to, um, not have to use words like boundaries or, I mean, yeah, you can use those words. Every, I mean, I don't know. Is this like everyone has their own walk? It's the gray. Totally. It's (laughs) the gray of just like, yeah, have, have awareness, but, but also have vulnerability of, um, just a community of people who you can talk to about these things, whether, you know, you're questioning your church and your beliefs and in your community is like, Oh, those are great questions. I've had those too. And the reason I share this situation with my sister is because maybe someone's like, Oh, I'm going through that too. Like I can't, I can't get on the same page as my brother and sister. So I push them away forever. And then you get to your deathbed or they get to their deathbed and you're like, Whoa, what a waste of an opportunity. And like my dad and I had like friction, but when he passed away from cancer, you know, so many things went through like, Whoa, I missed the ball on that, you know? And so, um, and and when healing that. And so, 
yeah, just really encouraging people, man. This life is so beautiful and wild and precious and to, to write someone off of your family members because of what they voted for, what they believe politically or religiously is just like a loss. We're just like, oh yeah. man. That's why the news can be, is mostly so toxic because it's so divisive on both sides, I feel like. And it just ends up, it pits everybody against each other. Yeah. So do you feel like with what happened with your dad that you had to even heal from those feelings of missing out? Oh, totally. Yeah. And that's what I want. I want everyone, even people have a tough relationship with parents. I'm like, yo, I know it's hard. I know they've called you names. I know they've wronged you. But try your best because there's something to be learned in it. And there's something that when they pass away, you will always hold this like level. If you don't do it, this level of like, oh my God, I could have just forgave him. You know, like he, I'm not saying it was my dad, but oh my God, it was just $10,000 like, or $5,000, $2,000. Or it was just this thing he said to me when he was mad once. Like, you know, it's like, that was so small. Like I could have forgave that. We could have, like he could have held my grandkids. You know, there's so much that we just hold on to this resentment because of money or, you know, broken people. And uh, I think everyone has a, a chance to, to find that revival and that healing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So do you feel like if we're going to talk about social media then, like what are the toxic things that you see happening based on all these things we've talked about with like judgment and divisiveness? Like how do people move from there? Because it is very easy for us to or for a lot of people to get quick to, you know, judge other people and maybe criticize or say, you need to be doing it this way and that way, or this person's back because of this, the call out culture, all that stuff. Like where, where do we go from here? Like as a collective? Yeah. Well, I think we go inward. I think we continue to heal and go inward and then realize that anyone that's attacking us is just hurting. Like they're just hurting and they have enough time in their day to spend 30 seconds on a comment to hate someone you actually have compassion for them like dang they must really be going through it to not only just be going through it but to spend time attacking someone when you could spend that time doing so much for people or the world or yourself or hiking you know what i'm saying and so just let, having that compassion and staying in your lane i've had haters since day one since you know i was traveling the world helping communities before social media was a thing i was working with high school kids before social media was a thing so it became like a uh byproduct of what I was doing um, and then haters came you know but you know your truth you know who you are and what you're doing and so it's like a bummer some days but I think to just always have compassion for those people and move on you know like I've had DMs and people try to attack me and cancel me for working with inner city kids helping build an orphanage in Uganda to to uh, picking a flower or feeding a homeless person yeah. like there's nothing you can do in our culture now that's not going to trigger someone so so just there really is not we yeah. probably have triggered so many people in this yeah you can hand a homeless person food and you know people will say that why wow, that's wrong you, can you pick did a it flower. wrong yeah you can yeah. pick a flower and someone says wrong so so just always staying true and committed and um you know using social media as a byproduct of what you're doing you know yeah. you're already being an amazing mother and conscious con consumer in your life and now social media has been a byproduct of that so many young people are like i want to be a youtuber i want to be an instagrammer i'm like that's not a thing that doesn't exist like find something you're passionate about enjoy it get really good at it if it's rock climbing if it's gardening if it's traveling and then have social media be the byproduct of it but right now this generation's coming up thinking that you were just handed these cookbooks and these vegan recipes yeah. <laughs> and these kids you know yeah. and and people think i'm handed this opportunity of like talking about this but 14 years of working with thousands of high school kids and young adults in trauma work yeah, i don't have a phd in front of my name but what is i mean and i do appreciate doctors of phds i do appreciate that <laughs> and i i there's something this experiential learning of if i've worked with thousands of people on their trauma for 14 years yeah, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to say I'm a doctor. I'm not going to prescribe medicine, but I understand it pretty well. You know, you're not a, a dietitian, but you understand uh, yeah. food really well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Um, but a lot, but there's just so much to say about it. I, I think that a lot of times, like you said, we're quick to judge anything, right? Um, there's going to be opinions no matter what about anything that you do you mentioned yeah. the picking a flower thing then there's also the understanding that hey maybe there's certain things i haven't considered like the tom's thing i thought have you ever heard about how people have criticisms towards how totally. that's actually affected um the people living in those communities that used to make shoes that have now been priced out of a job to even make shoes so that's an interesting component so sometimes it's like it's it's always interesting to listen right and be like okay where what could i be missing right but totally. the, but then there's also the factor of like looking in within your own heart and if you're feeling compelled to criticize others and just be like look they're doing it wrong they're, they should have been doing it this way and this way to look 
inward and also be like, okay, wait, what am I, what can I be doing? Yeah. Because that is um, something that we had talked about last night that I had seen someone say this quote that like, you'll never be criticized by someone who's doing more than you. Yeah. And that is, I mean, without a doubt, that has been my experience. Mm-hmm. Whoever is doing more than me, like they're too busy to criticize me. They're too busy. They, they, they don't have time to come and tell me how I'm doing it wrong. They're just going out and doing what they think is right. Yeah. They're going out and doing what they think is going to make a difference and what they think is the most helpful. And if you're sitting behind a screen and you're like typing, duh, 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 this person's doing it wrong, this person's doing it wrong, this is, you know, there's a difference between having like interesting conversations where you're curious or you're challenging in an interesting way as opposed to just criticism, this person's doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely... Um yeah, that's it. That's it's it's all of that. It's definitely heartbreaking to see. Yeah, the social media plays such a big role and just the divisiveness and the separation. But coming down to, I was telling you last night too. Like, you know, I've had so many so many things like that in, in the last ten years. But being like, hey, if you're not at the table, actually changing the world or making a difference, it's hard to listen to you because you're not trying. You know, and I would rather fail. Like Tom's, I would. You know, it. it I would rather fail something trying to help people then do nothing you know so tom's had it's like heart behind the idea was like oh this is an opportunity to help people and then found out there were certain situations but it helped a lot of people and yes it might have made mistakes along the way but you know why don't we why don't we care when nike or apple use child labor for their products like we don't care when nike and apple, know, like know. we buy nike and apple without a blink of an eye but they use child labor and all this stuff oh my gosh it's so true yeah. it's like a lot of times it's like oh the, all the things that aren't trying to help anyone there's no criticisms right. for no matter how much detriment or harm they're doing but anyone who's trying to help help someone it's like you're doing it wrong this one's not as good as this like that's so true yeah the verbiage yeah. everything is but there's also something sorry go ahead the verbiage no, yeah, I think, yeah, just, you know, I always come to like, yo, I, I you know, I went, when I went to inner city, you know, work with inner city kids and live in the communities and help as much as I could, I, w- you know, there's a quote that uh, an African-American mentor of mine said, and he said, you can't solve a problem you don't understand and you can't understand from a distance. And so every, com- every conversation I went into and every movement I've ever learned about, I had to get close to it to understand it. And, and to always just, just have that like awareness to be like, yo, you gotta like, yeah, you said build bridges, lean, lean in, ask questions and, and try to understand. And, and I, like I always tell people like, yo, I don't have a, I don't have a PhD in trauma work. Um, but, but I, I've, I learned by doing, and, and if I've made a mistake in certain situations, um, you know, it's, it's not, uh as long as it's not an intense mistake, you know, I'm not prescribing medication, but I'm not telling people not to do medication, but I, you know, I'm doing work that is anything, anything when you're giving back to somewhere, but yeah, nonprofits, philanthropy, helping people, you do one thing and it's, you're yeah. done, you know? But it is also, <coughs> sorry, I got water in my throat. <clears throat> it is also helpful to be able to be humble enough to open and hear when there is something that you can change right so with toms i wonder what happened with them because they could potentially be like oh we didn't realize this was happening maybe we can you know support these workers in these areas and actually have them make the shoes and we support them that way with our dollars Mm -hmm. so these kids are still getting the shoes but we're supporting the i don't know it was just it's just a thought like yeah yeah, did they start doing that so essentially they took that that conscious criticism that feedback and and learned from it and that's beautiful too exactly there's that balance yeah i would yeah i made a mistake i was wrong just like those things our ego hates saying Mm -hmm. you know i'm sorry yeah our ego is like never um our pride is like never like even when you're in an argument with your husband or with your mom and just your pride and your ego is just like this hard pill to swallow and you're like man i'm sorry i was really rude I, i made a mistake and i was wrong like you know and just like the beautifulness of those words um, that vulnerability is just incredible. Even with your kids someday, you know, you're going to make oh mistakes and say the wrong totally. things and they're going to ask questions. And I love all the questions Elvis asks. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's a really good question. Oh my er, gosh. He yeah. asks so many amazing I'm questions. Obsessed. People are like, Oh my gosh, this kid, everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's very curious. Yeah. And then, and you know, and like you said, your boundaries, you're doing your, you know, and you have these platforms, which is great, but your, your number one focus, a good wife, a good, um, mother, and that's your number one priority right now. And this is all beautiful and a byproduct, but you know, just, and then when your kids grow up, you'll transition to another thing. So everything in life is seasons and chapters and they don't define you, you know? And so I always want people to just like separate from, you know, these definitions to we're so much more than just X, Y, and Z, but this is the season of your life right now as you're committed and focused to those things. Yeah. Um, and they'll grow and evolve and shift. And, uh, yeah, that's the part of life. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I am a mother and a wife first, and that's what's the most important to me. And what you said about 
apologizing is such an important part of parenting and respectful parenting and just being that example to your kids yeah. too because when you're willing to say sorry when you've made a mistake they're going to be willing to say sorry when wow. they've made a mistake you know if mom can't even do it why would i do it yeah <laughs> right because we all make mistakes yeah oh and kids watch way more than they listen yeah they always watch their parents way more and so yeah it's but- so important and the way you love your kids now is going to overflow into the way they love their teammates and their classmates and their friends and it's all part of the intrinsic like overflow of of life yeah and so even my sister loving her where you know in her position now she's telling me stories where she's loving her employees more because she's feeling sick it's all about the neurosystem of the trauma but she, when we're in fight or flight mode we don't feel safe and so we're at, well, you know when you see someone driving and they're flipping people off and cutting people off and they're in that fight or flight mode but now my sister feels safe and and hopefully seen and supported to where now she her shoulders are dropped she's not in fight or flight mode of survival and now she's like oh my gosh my employee friend is having a tough day I should probably go ask her how she's doing. You know what I'm saying? So it all ripple effects into yes. everywhere. You can notice other people so much more when you're not caught up within yourself and dealing with your own crap and mm-hmm. your own trauma. Because if I'm ever going through something that's just really affecting my mental wellness and it's just, it takes over your whole day and that's all you can see. And suddenly you can find yourself snapping at your kids or you're not even noticing anything around you because you're just so caught up in your own problems in your brain and sometimes it's not even justified sometimes it's like the stories you tell yourself being more important than it actually is and that's Mm. why it's so helpful than like it's so helpful for me to have andrew because he is like this calming very strong presence for me that if i ever let something like get to me he's like that bringing down to reality maybe not in the way that i always like i might be like oh gosh i wish you said that different or i can't listen to you right now but at the end of the day he's right and he'll be like look that does not matter Hmm. like like look at around you like open your eyes and see what is actually in front of you and you'll see that that's actually like the problem you have in your head is not actually what you're making it out to be yeah and that's why breath work, meditation, yoga, like all these things are like, you can't think your way out of these problems. You can't, you know, the more we spend up here, the more dangerous it gets. It's like a snowball. And the second you lay in nature and you literally breathe for like, if, you, if no one's ever heard of breath work on this podcast, look it up. It's unbelievable. Um, but what they've discovered in breath work is you re-regulate your system and you get out of your head, into your body, and then you feel safe and you feel supported. You're like, oh my gosh, I was thinking, I was holding that much It was like grabbing glass. You were just cutting yourself more and bleeding. And so um, I love that, you know, these therapists, these doctors are just encouraging, you know, grounding outside, laying on the ground and breathing. Um, And uh, yeah, it's, it's so crucial. But we're all human. So definitely like there's, there's human, you can be human. Um, (laughs) Yeah, we're gonna be human. Yeah, we're gonna be humans. And I still, yeah, I'm not like there yet, you know, but I, I, uh, I've, you get resources and tools. What I tell my, my participants in my programs, my retreats is, you know, life never gets easier. You just get stronger and not in like a stronger muscular way, stronger, vulnerable way, stronger awareness. And so life, you're not going to have a million dollars or a million followers. And then you're like, oh, it's all easy now. It's like, no, that's usually the opposite. (laughs) Um, But you want a million followers and a million dollars so you have freedom. And most people who have those things have the opposite of freedom most of the time, you know, when it's done unyoked, like on a poor foundation. And so just being like, no, what you want is just inner peace of needing a lover. You know, even like Issa, my my wife, my partner, um, she is her own sovereign person and the, and there's no jealousy in our relationship there's no insecurities because we know how sovereign we are and that we don't belong to each other and i don't love this, this is kind of be kind of triggering i've never said this publicly yet but i was meditating and praying the other day and my what isa taught me my wife was i had to love people deeper and then my kid taught me how to love people deeper and so like i don't love my wife and kid i would say more than anyone else i literally try my best to unconditionally love everyone but what they invited me into is a deeper understanding of love. And so I don't, my, you know, there's like a, we separate people of like, I love my kids and my wife more. And it's like, well, no, they've taught you how to love deeper. And so you can love people better. Mm. And the end goal is to become better at loving people. And so if uh, a job can do that or money can do that or a lover or kids, then that's beautiful too. But um, I was like writing in my journal, I was like, yeah, I don't love Phoenix or Issa more. I just, 
they've taught me how to love deeper. Mm, um, that's interesting. I've never considered that. Yeah, it was super interesting. I was like, I don't know if I can say that publicly, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can say anything you want. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, but yeah, just that's the goal is really, you know, and, and you don't go to a doctor if you're not sick. So I'm never going to preach to people. You know, like I think people like pastors will get on the sidewalk and preach. And it's like, I'm never going to preach people about trauma or love or heart work. If, if you're not going to go to a doctor if you're not sick. So I'm going to do what I got to do. And if people are ready to do the work, whether you're 40 years old or 20 years old, we'll dance. But like, I never want to be a preacher or a leader. You know, I think uh, for me, the definition of a leader is a servant. And so I'm here to serve people, not lead people. And I really want to just help them. And even people on my programs like, Hey, should I, can I can't afford this retreat or this mastermind? Should I do it? Or I'm like, yo, if you don't feel I'm never going to convince someone or market someone selling like your, your, your vegan book. Like you figure you have to do like the marketing a little bit, but you're not going to sit there and be like, buy the book. It'll change your life. You know, like that just sends on inauthentic. And so I never sell my programs. I never do network mark. I never do marketing with it. I'm just like, this is it. And if you're 40 and you're a single dad, and if you're a 20 and a college student, you're all welcome. And we can all talk about these things. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I was thinking about the things that you said that help like ground you and heal your heart and i go back to like my mind change sessions with my friend heather mm -hmm. because i'll at the beginning of a session and during it they it like brings you to this place where you're in the heightened you feel those traumas the most you go to that place where you remember it and you feel it and it's really hard because then you feel it at its height and then by the end of it when you walk away like the days after i'm like wow i don't i don't feel that anymore why do i not feel that intensity in my brain that I did before yeah. that intensity where it felt like something this was seriously wrong this is a serious problem this is huge 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 the way that I felt it before I don't feel that anymore so that's really interesting I mean the, the greatest example is the movie Inside Out the kids movie I love that movie and they they like made a circle for sadness and they're like all right circle their sadness don't leave the circle and she's like oh, okay and like they're like sadness just stay away today and they realize i don't want to spoil the movie for anyone yeah. hopefully you've all seen it. it's an amazing movie but they realize sadness was the key was yeah. the secret key the portal that it's okay to feel it and actually you have to go through that portal to um heal yeah you have and to feel it yeah sadness is okay and right now in the western world we're literally raising a generation of like oh you're sad boom oh you're anorexic boom here's a pill oh you're um your ADD, here's a pill. You know, we're not asking the diet. Like even my mom went to the doctor the other day and I was so sad. She went to a doctor, an actual doctor, and she was like, I have heartburn. And he's like, oh, I'll take these pills and and good luck. And I was like, well, did he tell you about the pills? And she's like, no. I was like, did he ask about your diet? He's like, no. And I was like, he didn't ask what you're eating or yeah. how long to take the pills for or what's inside the pills, right? yeah. like what's the chemical? So I looked up the pills and they ended up being bad for her if you take it longer than a week. So anyway, I was just like so heartbroken and so... Um, yeah, the, it's okay to be sad. Like it's like depression is an umbrella to a lot of emotions that we just need to feel. And, and so to encourage people, it's okay to be angry. Anger is an okay thing. Like anger is okay. If you need to punch it out and punch it back or, or release this energy, like sadness and anger are okay. And so, um, I think people feel broken if they feel too sad or too angry. Um, and we just need to go back to, to like love. Love is the only thing that transforms someone. We Our minds want to change people. You know when people are like, not you, but like some vegans are like, oh, I wish, wish everyone was plant-based. I wish everyone was Christian. I wish everyone was this. Our mind and ego wants to change people, but the only thing that's ever changed anyone is love. It transforms people from the inside out. Not like when my mom's vegan, then I'll love her. Or when someone's Christian, then I'll love them. That's outside in. But love, you know, going to my sister and being like, yo, I'm gonna love you regardless, you know? has taught me a lot. So, totally. Um, and often, like for a lot of people, when they first become vegan or they watch a documentary or they listen to a speech and stuff, you might think, I gotta tell everybody. Everybody needs to, why is nobody else caring? And you're like, what the heck? Nobody cares what the heck? And you feel like you gotta change people. But then over time you realize, I just gotta be me and like just live the life that feels like the example. And then it really does come that way, just being the example. Yeah. Because nobody likes to be told what to do. No one. Yeah. But when you mentioned the thing about... Um, emotions and not um, people feeling like they can't be sad or angry. It made me think back to what you said about um, the 30 year old men, the, the the boys in the 30 year old men bodies, because oftentimes, not always, but it, more often boys are kind of taught to shove their emotions down. And I think it is changing with this like uprising of respectful parenting, positive parenting that we see now, but I don't think it's as big as it definitely could be. 
It's understanding that like, you know, boys need to be able to express their emotions and their sadness and their feelings just as much as girls do and to not like separate the two as like only a real boy or a strong man mm. would, would, wouldn't cry, you know, type thing. And that stuff, it makes total sense why we have so many broken men growing up because girls are more likely to be accepted and loved and held when they're feeling sad. It's more accepted, right? For a girl, not always, but that's just what I've seen. And for boys, it's kind of like shove it down, don't cry. I don't feel those sad feelings. So no wonder when you're an adult, you don't know how to handle your emotions and you just want to yell at someone when you're actually just feeling sad. You just need to be sad for a little bit with your friend or your partner. Yeah. I mean, one in three suicides adults is men. Like men are, you know, 70% more chance to take their life because of that. Like women, you know, and, and I mean, there's so much we can talk about, you know, women show their emotions and have their own feminine cycles and moon cycles and you know release this energy and then yeah men have you know this 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 energy with the feminine where it's like more of an attacking thing or an alpha thing or you know there's like this men work doing right now even right now there's probably 78 percent women listening to this right yeah Which whenever is, i get like a man that comes up to me or says like hey you're that podcaster i'm like I'm, that's awesome that thanks for awesome. listening to my podcast yeah i like grab them when i when i hear people saying that i'm like oh my you're so amazing you don't even know and so <laughs> Yeah, I've been in this work for so long. I'm, it's now shifting. So basically, what I was telling Lauren the other day was um, men only evolve to where women put the bar. And so, you know, women are like money, muscles, and success. You know, so men are like, oh, cool, that's where I got to get to. And right now, women are having their own liberation and sovereignness and awakeness to where now men are like, whoa, I have to read these books books yeah. and breath work and meditate <laughs> and and okay i'll you know so it's now happening right now which is really exciting to see um it's still slow but you know you just have to be patient with it and yeah. um and just encourage every emotion every uh, yeah. like literally in our next program our online program we have a 40 year old entrepreneur guy doing it and he's never really talked about these things and i'm like just geeking out every time i talk to him i'm like oh my god i'm so excited like yeah Dude, congrats. Like, yeah. oh, to be 40 year old man and to be like, well, I need to do the work. I need to forgive my mom or whatever it is. Yeah. Cause you, a lot of times you think, oh, they're fine on the surface level, but you really don't know what's going on inside a lot of the times with um, grown men. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And you just ask certain questions. And, and uh, even my mentor, he is wrote two New York best time selling books, Tommy Spaulding. And he teaches CEOs of Fortune 500 companies how to love their employees better. Like literally, like how to know them by name, how to know their families' names, like how to love better. And so, um, yeah, it's been beautiful to watch that journey. And then a lot of those CEOs' kids come to our programs. And so I've received phone calls from the founder of Groupon being like, hey, you changed my daughter's life. I want to fly you to Chicago and host you because she now has emotion and passion and purpose. And I'm like, oh, cool. So it's cool to see like, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, like the pinnacle of it is now learning to love better is the dream. And wow. that's where hopefully money and conscious capitalism come into play. And that's uh, where more change, real change actually happens. Totally. And yeah. you mentioned something about like the words that you put to like what you're looking, something about that, about looking to feel. And it made me think back to a mind change session I did with Heather and I said something about maybe I need thicker skin and she's like but is that really what you want do you really want thicker skin in all situations or or is it that you need that you need something else mm -hmm. and that was interesting to me just about the wording that I was thinking this is what I need I just need to have thicker skin I need a, you know that type of thing yeah. but really it was more about like letting down the boundaries opening up and a lot it was so much more meaningful than just thicker skin and so yeah. that just also makes me think about the the men boys and the men's body thing totally yeah i know and i have such a you know heart and compassion for for men but such a celebration for the ones doing the work and and the the, the balance the dance between the you know men have feminine energy and features um, we came from a feminine energy, like we came through the portal of our mom's womb and legs um, into this world. And so we're extremely connected to the feminine. We just have been so hurt and, you know, disappointed. Maybe now we're like men back in the day were protectors of the tribes and women. And now we're the predators. Like we've literally lost purpose as men. And so we've lost now protecting women to now we prey on women. Like we're the dangerous part now. So, you know, having tons of empathy and compassion, like never judgmental, but, but to, to really like call men up into this like divine masculine, not the alpha and the betas. Like there's like these men be like, you don't, don't date a beta man. It's like, okay, you're already, you're already using the wrong term, but divine masculine that is gone through into the feminine energy, into their mother, into their sister, into the compassionate holding space um, for like, oh, she's PMSing or she's dramatic. And it's like, 
dude like listen you know listen um but yeah totally. that could be a whole episode oh i know <laughs> trust me i mean yeah we could there's so many fun ways we can go with this uh but um yeah it's been obviously amazing this is i hope you know everyone listening i hope i hope there's a lot of men out there listening and and uh just yeah felt a little bit of hope and light totally i mean there's a couple more things i think would be fun to no, touch totally. on i'm just encouraging everyone if you're still listening yeah. i love you yeah. <laughs> you're amazing <laughs> totally i'm thankful for anybody who listens like this far into the episodes totally. or what, what listens to the whole thing it's celebrate yourself right now so fun if you're listening um so yeah. what let's talk a little bit about jealousy and like where does it come from what how can you turn it into something beautiful yeah jealousy is a tough one um I think where I get most heartbroken is people use this scripture that je- God is a jealous God, you know, um, and we've turned that into country songs and like rap songs. Um, <laughs> but jealousy is is not is not sustainable. It is not. Um, it is. It, it doesn't work in the algorithm of loving people um, because you know you're not going to get jealous. It, it, it's basically stemming from an insecurity, right? So if your son goes and jumps on your dad the dad and goes i love you daddy you're the best parent you're the best dad you know you're gonna hopefully if you're healed you're gonna be like oh that's amazing that my son loves my dad that his dad that much or if you're really unhealed and insecure you'll be like oh my i gotta i gotta buy him something i got to uh i gotta reclaim this first position parent you know and it happens in our families it happens with our kids it happens with our friends it ha- and then it happens with our romantic life and then so many relationships end because we weren't e- we weren't healed enough to know that it's okay if my partner has guy friends and loves them and compliments their looks you know what i'm saying like you, and so it, it just limits us a lot of the time to friendships and um, yeah it's just a it just goes back to the what's going on inside your heart and your head uh, that is making you insecure that your kid can't compliment the dad or your wife or husband can't go grab coffee with, you know, another man or woman. What about jealousy for some, for something that you don't have? Ooh, yeah, that's the comparison. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so jealousy, uh, the, there's a different studies on this too and spiritual side of it. But basically it, it is when you're jealous of someone that has something it's because you know you're worth it. Your soul knows that you also deserve a beautiful house in Hawaii with these kids and this amazing loving husband, but your ego and your trauma is attacking it because your ego and your trauma is scared of that kind of love. And so, um, yeah, jealousy on that level is very divisive when it's like, oh my God, BC has a beautiful wife and a healthy kid, you know? I'm so jealous of that and it's like, no, you deserve it and you're worthy of it. And you're worthy of someone who adores you and loves you and you're worthy of a kid and a job that is amazing for you. Like you're so worthy of it and we're not different. We're not separate from these people that look up to us or, you know, want a certain aspect and they're hard. They, people also, you know, people don't look at how hard our life is and the back end on different things. Um, it's just a different kind of hard. Um, and so yeah, jealousy really stems from, I know I'm worthy of it and I deserve it. Um, whether you want to be a coach or a vegan chef or a vegan cookbook, you know, or an author. Um, but we're just really mad and sad that, uh, we don't have it and we're not willing to do the work to get it. I think, yeah, I think that, um, jealousy, that, that whole phrase, jealousy is a thief of joy is Mm -hmm. so true. And it kind of reminds me of the, um, being a victim to something versus victimhood, living in victimhood as well. It's a similar type of thing. If you're living in this state of jealousy of looking at somebody else, like I could look at someone else and what they have and be like, Oh God, it's so not fair that they have that or this or that it's and be jealous about it and compare. But really, if you turn that into something that's inspirational and be inspired by it and be like, what are they doing that I can do to have a piece of that or to do that? Because it's so, it's unlimited. It's like the type of, because success is, is all relative. It's not just money. It's not just looks. It's not just family. Like success is what you feel success is. And there's no limitation to it. There's no, there's no, this pot of, or pool of like certain people can have it. Certain people cannot. That's just not how it works. And so realizing that and being inspired by others and what you can do to take action in your own life, as opposed to sitting back and being like, I could never be this and that. And with that self deprecating talk, that negative talk that you give yourself, like that's only going to make things worse in your life as opposed to being inspired by others. Yeah. When you heal jealousy, becomes possibility and so basically what you're jealous of 
is what you desire, but then someone did it, so that means you can do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you have four kids on this land in Hawaii, and before that didn't exist, maybe, you know, I'm using a metaphor, but like maybe that didn't exist in someone's psyche. Maybe that was someone's dream and goal to be plant-based and live off the land, all this stuff, and then they see it, and they have two options. They can either go, oh my God, she's doing it, that means I can do it, or, oh my God, that's that's she cheated or something like that, you know? Yeah. And so always coming back, success keeps count. And so success is an energetic vibration. It's like a person where it watches you and it, it watches and it only wants to be around where it's celebrated. And so if you can't celebrate your friend's success mm. or your stranger's success, then success won't want to hang out with you. That's so and, true. And, and so like success is like, no, I'm not gonna hang out with you. You're like dogging out. You're not gonna buy your friend's t-shirt or your friend's product <laughs> or you know support this mother. Um, then I'm not gonna hang out with you. And so we literally opposite magnetic repel. You repel it. Yeah. Um, and they've proven this too with science that we are magnetic fields. Like we actually draw in, like, this is the positive, um, like a battery and this is the negative. And so we draw in from the ground, we draw in from our experiences and then we emit a frequency that that comes to us of whatever we're creating. And so, and that's science now, like that's not even woo woo anymore. But um, yeah, jealousy is just being thankful that someone else did it so you can be, do it too. Yeah, or, or maybe you find inspiration from a certain aspect of it. <clears throat> like you might say like, wow, living off the land, but hey, I don't want to go to Hawaii. I'd rather live in Colorado. I'd rather yeah. live in the mountains. I'd rather live, but I can make steps. Like, what, is, what is this person doing that I can make steps to to get exactly. to my Reason own goals? Plant -based, like yeah, or to get to, and just getting to your own goals, but finding inspiration from everybody else that you like there's just something about it when you look at somebody and you're like and you look at their life and you're like what are they doing that's wow that's so great and what pieces can you take from that to like build your own life that you love yeah and realizing that you personally i know you have trolls and people that have you know commented negative things but 99.9 .9 of people that you've changed their life or inspired them to raise their kids plant-based or become vegan or move to Hawaii like you, you know you've changed all this. but sometimes we focus on that one percent you know and like i'm i'm I've done it a million times where I see that one comment, you know, or author is like one of my mentors, an author, and he's like, I can have a thousand good things about my book and the Amazon review, that one that hates me, it like destroys my whole day. And it's like, wow, why is that, you know? And, and, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I once had, uh, I once was going through a heated moment on social media and I was talking to a friend who gets plenty of that. And she was like, look, there's no, there's not that many haters. Just remind yourself that it's just that it's just the negative ones are just louder. Yeah. And so it seems like more when really you have like so much overwhelming love and support because it's e I think it's easy to get to a place where you start to just feel this negative outward like the, oh all these people must have this negative outlook about you when you don't feel that inside. Yeah. And so it's like it's just this disconnect when really it's just like that's not actually reality yeah. <laughs> because you could look at even like um reviews on restaurants like people are more likely to leave a negative review than they are to take the time to go and leave a positive review because yeah. if you're upset by something you're like more you, i don't know people just feel more motivated to go t say something that they didn't like about this restaurant as opposed to be like i had a great experience i should go leave a review like how often do you go on amazon and like oh i really like the product i'm gonna go leave this nice review about this product like way 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 less yeah. so isn't that weird about our human psyche of wanting to like I don't know, feel, we feel more justified. We feel this like need to go and say what we think is wrong with this, this, and this. And we're less likely to put something positive out into something that you actually really valued and admired. Why is that? Yeah, well, the, the, what comes to my mind is like just the confidence in who you are, the confidence in what you're doing. And the word confidence, when you, when you trace back to like the original Latin Greek, means trust like full trust within. And so confidence is when we when we trust this thing within us that we just know is our truth. You know raising your kids plant-based right now, you're just like, yo, it's working. Like I don't have to prove it to anyone, right? Yeah. I know my spiritual experience with God is real. I don't have to prove it to anyone. I don't have to justify it. And so always coming back to like what is the internal thing again, you know, I don't want to be broken record, but just where's the, where was the confidence lost? Where was the trust lost within yourself? And a lot of people have imposter syndrome, right? That's like a big uh, term. And I'm like, yo, if you're feeling imposter syndrome, you're doing something right. Like you're, you are creating yourself in a place that doesn't exist yet. Cause you believe in the future version of yourself. And so if you're feeling imposter syndrome, hell yeah, you're doing something right because you're pushing yourself outside your comfort zone to what you don't know exists yet. And, and to always, yeah, come back to, um, 
you know, just that confidence, that inner peace. Uh, the only, yeah, the only thing you have control over. But, I love that. That's yeah. a good point because you have to go and do it. Like instead of just, not just like imagine your dreams, you have to actually speak it and do it and start making, creating oh my that gosh. action. Yeah. If, if everyone, I mean, I don't know if you shared this online, but everyone knew you and Andrew's journey of how you guys came here and hustled and like, you know, we're just like, yo, we're confident that we want to live on this island. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get that, you know, and, and you did and you created it and no one sees that. Um, and no one understands that, but that's like every entrepreneur, every author. Like I'm always telling people like the reason people are public speakers and authors is because they engaged in life. Like they showed up to friction. They showed up to events. They showed up to things they engaged and engagement creates stories. Um, not engagement, like social media engagement, but engagement in relationships. Yeah. And so every book that's written, every public speaker is because they failed at something or they tried at something. Um, and so just encouraging people always to just engage with life. Yeah. That's really helpful. I um, think. Okay. Yeah. I have one more question. I think it's a great one to end it with. Cool. Um, what are some, or what is a lesson that you're in the middle of learning right now? Wow. Oh my goodness. I am learning. I mean, that's a big one because I'm, I'm learning, um, to over communicate, to really be better at communicating. Um, when, when you, uh, yeah, when you're unclear, you become unkind, you know, where this idea where like you just have to, and the, and the reason I'm saying that is because I'm trying to start a business that's like fully focused on people's hearts and like this ministry of like just loving people. And I'm trying to make it capitalistic and make it sustainable and pay my friends that help, yeah. help people in this group. And I keep making mistakes. And um, so, yeah, I'm just learning how to go, you know, with extreme vulnerability and leadership where I'm, you know, I can be looked at as an example. It's like BC's ran all these amazing retreats. They have 150 alumni from 20 countries. Like he's done all this stuff. What a leader. And I'm like, yo, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, as a parent too. Yeah. Like I have no, and I tell my team this. I have no idea what I'm doing, y'all. I'm trying my best and I'm learning as I go, but don't look to me like, man, BC's figured this out. It's more of like, y'all, I'm messing up all the time and please have patience and grace and compassion for me. Um, and same with my wife when I make mistakes and I drop the ball on my mental health or my showing up for her. Um, I'm learning right now that there's only, uh, you can disappoint a lot of people in your life, but there's some people you can't and that's your kid and your wife. Yeah. And so I'm learning to disappoint a lot of people um, because of my priorities of like, yo, I can disappoint. There's like this idea when you're juggling life with all these balls, there's rubber balls that will bounce back up like money or jobs, but there's glass balls. And if that glass ball falls and shatters, that's my wife, that's my mm -hmm. um, kid. That's, that's something that won't bounce back up. And so relearning my priorities letting a lot of people down in my people pleasing yeah. trauma you know it's yeah. like i hate letting people down i'm a people pleaser i love being there for everyone and now i'm just like don't return calls don't return text messages and spend a lot more time with you know my wife and, and my kid and uh you know people might not like me for that but people who really get me will be will patient. understand yeah <clears throat> yeah especially like you just have a new baby yeah congratulations by the Thanks. way you have the cutest baby he is so sweet Aww. three months old yeah. little phoenix skywalker like he could not be cuter so <laughs> but you yes the priorities of like having your partner and your baby and what's what are you going to do to keep that communication and life flowing really well with a brand new baby because it's a lot of work but you guys do it seamlessly you guys are doing yeah. Clear, it's clear you guys are so, so chill and then like those good, good yeah. vibrations together. Yeah, we're learning. I'm, like I said, I'm, I think relationships are the greatest wealth. At the end of the day, like that's what I preach more than anything is, is relationships, showing up for people, being there for people will in the cosmic, you know, karmic energy of the world or heavenly culture or heavenly currency, I call it sometimes, but just show up and people will always reciprocate that in the long term. Like for instance, there's these group of high school kids I mentored for four years when they were in high school and they were, this was like a long time ago and then their parents reached out to me last year and go, hey BC, we have this um, 15 person cabin in Breckenridge you can use for retreats for free whenever you want. And so when I mentored these four kids eight years ago, I didn't know, I wasn't getting paid, but eight years later, the parents were like, hey, we have this place you can use for a retreat that would be $6,000 for free. And I'm, I'm always encouraging people like, yo, relationships, like I know capitalism, I know money runs the world sometimes, but show up with love and servanthood and relationships and I promise you it'll 
comes full circle someday. Yeah. And uh, just always, and so I'm always learning. I'm always learning how to, uh, you know, value relationships. Um, social media can be tough sometimes because we want to get back to people's DMs or our consumers, these products. But just being like, yo, am I, am I not going to call my text, my sister, my mom, my wife, all these things over these DMs, you know? Um, so yeah, just, I'm always learning. Yeah, the priorities. It's really hard. It's a hard balance because it's the type of job where it never really ends. Like oh you don't clock out and be like, okay, nine to five, there's really nothing else for me to do. Or I finished my task and I'm done because there's always more you can be doing. Always. So it's definitely a balancing act that I've had to learn to just let go and not get everything done and not do as much as maybe I would like to do um, because of the priority of wanting to be with my family. Totally. And it's no. force versus flow. I'm always telling, you know, Isa and I are, is this in flow? Like coming here to Hawaii, we're like, all right, do we have the budget for it? Does it make sense? Or do we have to be somewhere else? But if it's in flow, then we're not forcing it. And so always just realizing like, what are you forcing and making happen? Or what is in flow with like opportunities and, yeah. and, and that. And so, um, yeah, just, yeah, staying grounded, connected. And, and I don't want to ever like tell, you know, make people feel like I have it figured out or I'm, I'm an amazing husband or parent or leader because of X, Y, and Z, but it's, it's because of my vulnerability, because I'm so strong in my weakness that I'm able to ask for help. And I'm able to tell my team like, Hey guys, I let you all down. Like I, we didn't make enough money. I can't pay you all. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like that's like super tough. Um, and so yeah, just leading with vulnerability, leading from the heart. Um, it's tough. That's no, but that is the that is the key because when you're holding things in in your brain and not not letting things out and being vulnerable, it really messes things up. Yeah, and people will always meet you. The strongest, like I always tell people, and this probably said before, but the strongest person in any room is the is whoever's the most vulnerable. And anytime you lead with vulnerability, like even when you're in a fight, you know, and you're like, I'm sorry, actually, I was wrong. Someone's like, Wait, what are you? We're supposed to keep fighting, you know? <laughs> like when someone cuts you off, or you cut someone off, and or they cut you off and you like wave a peace sign, you know, and you're not like that mad at them. And, and they're so countercultural of how hate <laughs> and fear works. And, um, and so always trying to in, interrupt where you can lead with vulnerability. And most people, when you lead with vulnerability, they're like, whoa, like your team, if you're a leader or a CEO or a coach or a parent, just leading with vulnerability, people go, whoa, I had no idea you were balancing that. Um, I don't want to fight with you. I want to like meet you where you're at. So yes. yeah. At the heart of this whole conversation, it really feels the, the importance of vulnerability and tuning into what you can do now instead of po pointing the fingers outward mm -hmm. and focusing on the day to day, what you're doing day to day, um, to show up and helping others and turning the pain into purpose. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Going from surviving to thriving to really not fight or flight mode. If I'm just trying to survive to to uh, yo, I'm here on Earth. What are the chances? And I'm I love loving people, and I want to have fun. Yes. I want to dance. Like I, you know, people. The work that we do could be deep trauma work and healing our parents' um, relationships. But then we're dancing and having fun, and then we're crying and praying over each other, and then we're cuddle puddling. And so it's like it's a mix between all of it, and it's all beautiful. And there, you're supposed to have goofy funness and dance while healing, like. It's yeah. part of it. And that's why I am so thankful for my partner because whenever we do have moments, one of us will be having a moment where we're losing control or not grounding ourselves, getting in our heads, right? Because you have all these things bubbling up of whatever's triggering you. Um, the other will help be like, hey, look, everything's okay. Look around you. Like, I got this. And then the other one will take over, which is really helpful. So I, I don't know if I can say that I love everyone equally. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that you said that. It's such an interesting thing to, to, to contemplate, mm -hmm. right? But I'm like, Andrew and I have been together for 20 years and I this is our 20th year together. Like that is just crazy that we've been together since we were 15 and 60. Like we have changed so much. That's incredible. With each other. Yeah. Like a lot of times I think high school relationships, like the reasons why they most time don't work out because you're still figuring out who you are. Yeah. And then you, be, you become in a way and you're like, no, nope, this isn't my person. But we like evolved and helped each other grow in our better, best ways. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm just so thankful for that grounding presence and relationship to like help me when I'm, or and for me to help him. The other one can just take over when yeah. we're starting to lose sight of the presence. Yeah. And your two girlfriends came over the day and you guys went on a trip where they can help you in ways he can't. And, totally. and so we just need each other. We need community. We're, we're tribal creatures and we're emotional creatures. And, and the more cerebral we get, the more disconnected, the more, you know, we have a microchips the size of a, you know, my fingernail the, 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 we lose that connection. We think we can outsmart our way out of everything. And so, um, yeah, just, 
letting people know, yeah, that vulnerability, that community, like your girlfriends came over and it was like medicine for you, you know, and then totally. Andrew has things that they don't have. And so we all need each other and we all need to be vulnerable in community together. And that's why the church was so beautiful for so long. It did that so well. And it's, it, you know, it's kind of been crippled because of certain things in it. But people, everyone who I've ever talked to that's left the church, they always say they miss worship music, singing together, and they miss like the communion together and the family vibes. Um, they left for other reasons, but they're like, man, I, church has like certain ingredients that are amazing. Um, and so, you know, what our ministry and our program, what we do in our pursuing purpose is a new idea of a church um, that has uh, certain, you know, things that we, we didn't feel safe in. Yeah, that's um, fascinating. And yeah. also it depends on the church too because exactly. there's so many different types of totally. churches. Totally. Yeah. Well, I think we talked about a lot. I can't even believe it's been two hours. Yeah. And this was so much fun. Really, really great that we got to just like delve deep into these topics. And I'm just thankful for everything that you're doing and sharing. I'm constantly finding inspiration from you. So everybody go follow his Instagram. Um, it's just really, really nice to like put your feed in a way where you're like getting uplifting information that's like good reminders because a lot of times we just lose touch we lose sight of things because we're in such a fast-paced world we got all these different things driving us in a certain way but when you like really tune in and focus like what matters the most and um this whole turning pain into purpose and like helping others is really just at the heart of it i think that's beautiful so thanks for everything that you're doing oh thanks so much it's been an honor here in in your house and with your kids the last couple of days i'm obsessed and in love with all your kids and uh, thank you so much for having me. And, and this has been such a highlight. And so thank you. My kids are obsessed with you guys. Oh and that's gosh. a good indicator. We have, we have I'm a literally going to miss them. I'm oh. literally like, I cannot wait to just like see Elvis the next time I see him and oh. all of them. But, oh, I yeah. know. They are honestly going to miss you. You and Elvis should probably be pen pals. Yes, that would be so fun. He made another pen pal um, earlier. So yeah, that would be so much fun. And they, they just love you guys. And so you guys really honestly are like, living exactly what you're talking about oh, and we feel that so thanks we've had such a good time with you and if you're listening i love you appreciate you um i just want to celebrate you for sitting through this whole episode and just leaning in i hope it was a roller coaster of emotions and <laughs> and uh yeah i love you and i appreciate you i see you and celebrate you for diving in that's a it's a really intense topic sometimes yeah talking about forgiving our parents or healing our heart and so uh if you're even in the sphere of thinking of this congratulations yeah thanks so much for being here all right, I think we'll end it. <laughs> Yay! Yay!